What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to episode number 636 of the Smart Out Moment Smack Talk Podcast Hot Tags of the Week. We've got a lot to break down again this week, so we're going to get into it very, very soon. But first things first, we need to tell you who we are in case you are brand new. I am Tony Mango, joined as always by Callum Wiggins. Hello. And Robert E. Felice. Hey. And of course, we will be breaking down everything that happened over the past few days that we feel like talking about from the gossip and rumors and news and TV recap stuff and things coming up in the future, people getting fired from companies, people leaving companies, cats and dogs, you know, it's all over the place here again, but hey, you know, it makes it for an interesting episode, so strap yourselves in, and while you are doing that, make sure you also tell us what you have to say about all these different things that we are going to be talking about here. One way that you can do that is by joining the Discord server that we have. Check out the link that's over there in the uh, description below on YouTube. Check out the uh, link that's on the sidebar of smartcoutmoment.com. Head on over there and you know, chat it up in all the different channels that we have there. Also, you can just leave a comment below on YouTube if you are on YouTube. And while you are doing that, make sure you click that like button. It helps us out quite a bit. Totally free option. Double check that you are subscribed to this channel as well. Ring that little notification bell for when we go live for the pay-per-view point post shows. Because remember, the next one that we're going to be having for this is going to be happening at a completely different time than normal. So the uh, Elimination Chamber stuff starts at something like 5 in the morning from uh, Eastern time. And, you know, I mean, that means that we're basically going to be doing this at like somewhere around, you know, 9, 10 in the morning or so. We'll be eating breakfast. Calvin will be eating lunch. It'll be a great time. I'll be eating my post dinner because I just won't go to bed. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, it's just going to be one of those days. You know, I'm used to going to bed at like seven in the morning or something. So I just won't. <laughs> and you're going to get super sleepy looking, Tony, and all that. But that's going to be fun in its own way. So double check that you have that email notification thing set up. So that way you get that. And then you don't go like, oh, man, I forgot that it's a different time or whatever like that. And you can join us for the live chat and stuff. Thank you again to those who joined us for the NXT Vengeance Day 1 and all those super chats. Also, thank you to Nathan, our newest member of the Dark Cast here over on the Patreon side of things. And, you know, that's a method of helping us keep the lights on here. It also gives you access to different episodes that you can only get on that Dark Cast here. It's the same Patreon stuff as over there on the channel membership on YouTube. The only difference being YouTube channel membership, you get the video portion of it too. So, either way, Greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you, Nathan, for that. Redbubble and Public is where you can pick up merchandise. And, you know, if you want to just toss a little spare change our way, you get the little thanks button that's on there on YouTube, too. That's something that uh, if you particularly like one episode and you don't want to necessarily commit to the pick your poison or, you know, uh, do any kind of monthly subscription thing, you know, do it that way. And, you know, we're still uh, incredibly, incredibly thankful for anybody that does anything like that and helps us out. So we've got so much to talk about here and it's hard to even figure out where to start because you would think that you know a lot of people want us to start with the wrestlemania kickoff thing i think that we can take some other topics and kind of lump them into there a little bit later so maybe we'll hold off on that one talk about some of the oddball topics instead first one of them being the release of Amari Miller from NXT, who hadn't really been seen in a long time. I don't remember the last match that she actually competed in. I have to double check on cage match now, but uh, she had been kind of one of those like early stars from the NXT 2.0 era. And, you know, she wrestled a few matches here and there. She was on the uh, 205 Live and Level Up and all wrestled a handful of matches on NXT itself and seemed to be kind of heading towards something and then disappeared. And we eventually found out that she was having some mental health issues and that she was struggling with depression and everything. So then she basically stopped being a part of WWE. It seemed, you know, I don't remember her being on any promotional graphics or anything in a long, long time. And, I honestly uh, forgot that she was even on the roster a lot of the time until I would go through my list and be like, oh, okay, yeah, no, they technically haven't released her. According to Cage Match, she did wrestle a few times somewhat recently. She had wrestled she was on level up recently. 
she had wrestled in uh you know her consistent time frame ended in january of last year and she went from wrestling in a battle royal on nxt at, at new year's evil 2023 to not wrestling again until december 5th on level up so an entire year basically of just not being around she wrestled again on a live show in january 6th and then again on the uh, level up episode that she lost to jada parker on uh, january 9th so three matches since her hiatus and now she's you know out of the company i don't know if it was a mutual thing or if it was just them being like all right well you know we kind of yeah no, think it's it best a, for you to just leave her or contract expired and, and they just didn't resign just decided yeah it's best we part ways makes sense and uh you know i don't think that we really have any like you know super fond memories or like you know projections of where we think that she could have necessarily gone or whatever but um you know it's an update to the roster page nevertheless so i still wanted to put it out there uh do you guys think that you're gonna see her popping up anywhere or do you think she might be potentially done in wrestling i don't know enough to confidently answer yeah i mean we don't really know anything about her history and stuff it seems like she might be interested in continuing to wrestle though that'd be great then i'd look forward to seeing it more women's wrestlers and more wrestlers in general is something i will never complain about anywhere you think she'd fit in better callum what is no idea pick, I could, yeah i could pick her out the lineup so <laughs> <laughs> well i mean when it comes to a roster that you think could use another woman he can't say um, what she's Capable yeah, I have, I have, yeah, I have no idea how, she, how good she is, how bad she is. Like, yeah, feel your boots. Just go some go somewhere that's just looking for people with like bodies <laughs> to work. Work a battle royal somewhere. I don't know. I would say without knowing too much, go go work with Booker T for a while in Texas. Go go get some reps. Yeah, maybe that. Uh, maybe we see her popping up in AEW. Maybe we see her in ROH. Maybe she heads on over to Impact. I don't know. Um. Somebody else that we need to keep an eye on, though, from NXT who might be leaving in June is Dijak. His contract is coming up. And, you know, I mean, just because somebody's contract's coming up doesn't necessarily mean that they are leaving. But many times that does end up being the case. And Dijak hasn't had the best track record of being pushed, you know, consistently in WWE. He's somebody that they were doing something with. And then they did the whole retribution thing that completely turned upside down. NXT was a second chance for him and they still dropped the ball, I think. And he's currently in that upper mid card range in NXT yet still can't win the North American title and still isn't fighting for the uh, NXT championship on stand and deliver. Ha ha Rob. <laughs> I had to throw it out there. Um, do you guys think Dijak sticks around? Do you think he goes somewhere else? I see him sticking around. I still think he should be the NXT champion. They're clearly not going that route. Tony, thanks. But <laughs> I, I think that it's a good path. So I, I would look to see him win that title by mid-year. Uh, it's another one that I don't really have too much. I mean, interest one way or the other. If he's in NXT, I won't watch. Which is, if he's in NXT, I won't watch it. I don't want him to go to AEW. And yes, yeah, so, and then if he goes into a place like Impact or something like that, I'm sure it'd be a big deal. But it won't be saying that I'd watch regularly. So, but isn't it just generally sad that like I remember Dijak being a guy where it was like, oh man, he's really good, mm-hmm. you know, and people were clamoring for oh, yeah. him. There's, there's not an issue with his ability or anything like that. It's just you know he's just been the same and they've like changed up the gimmick a few times but he's kind of really generally been the same since he came into nxt and yeah and there's been what five six years since he joined nxt it's been a few yeah and he had one shot was had one like shot of the main roster where completely failed with because the gimmick was dead on arrival but yeah and so like, i think that's just other people have passed him by an interest and like in terms of just like being exciting characters he's just grown far too stale at this point so yeah i think that he's probably just a better place to say in nxt unless he feels like he's got an opportunity to 
uh, establish himself at another smaller promotion and then build himself back up to a bigger deal, it being like a bigger deal, like almost like a, um, you know, just a taking the example of someone like a Cody or a Drew McIntyre going away to do something on a smaller stage and then come back when you're somewhat more undeniable. Dijak's yeah. a guy that I've really liked, and I do see a lot of good in him, but they did waste the years that really could have been setting him up. He's 36 right now. It's not like he's like, you know, over the hill or anything. I say that as a 36 year old, <laughs> but uh, I kind of, I would put it this way. My ideal scenario, he starts getting pushed in WWE and it actually goes somewhere. But what I kind of want to see from him, even though I wouldn't really see it technically, I'd like to see what he could do in New Japan. I think maybe he would be a bigger deal over there than anywhere else. Dude's tall. He can go in the ring. Like He could have a lot of presence there, I think. And if not there, I think that TNA could potentially be the spot where he wins you know, this world title over there and he becomes another big deal and a different way. I think AEW would be a mistake. I think that they would never really utilize him any way more than he is right now in WWE. Yeah, he could go to like ROH and maybe he'd be like the television champion or something, but I honestly don't think that they would put that belt on him even. There's too many people in AEW as it is, despite all the championships that they have, and not everybody that has left WWE seemingly in a good spot to go to AEW and be a major deal has reached anywhere close to that status. Plenty of them are in the exact same spot that they've been in. Look at Keith Lee, for instance. Yep, I was supposed to go. I think it's real sad that it's not like, ah, well, let's watch him run it back with Keith Lee. Mm -hmm. Because it's just, it just ain't there right now. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there's, I'm sure, some hesitation to push Keith Lee when it comes to his recurring health issues and all, but it's not just Keith Lee that's had that going on. There's been plenty of other people that are, you know, Tony Nese, for instance, a guy that's like, oh, is he going to go to the more sports oriented brand? And maybe be like a bigger deal in a smaller pond. And then it's like, no, he's now he's just in Ring of Honor. And yeah, I think that Dijak would kind of fall into the same rut. I don't think he'd be treated like some, you know, the the Well Ospreys and the, uh, you know, Kenny Omega types and all. So if he does leave, I'm kind of hoping that he goes to either New Japan or to uh, TNA more so than AEW. And I would hope that maybe in the meantime, when we lead up to June, that maybe WWE realizes that there is something to him and maybe they start pushing him and keeping him there anyway. Seems like at least one person could potentially not be coming to WWE right now, though, that I was hoping would be there, and that's Camille. Because WWE just can't seem to get these people <laughs> anymore. And now the rumors are all that she is expecting to go to AEW and... You know, I mean, they could use her, that's for sure. It's not going to be a bad thing for AEW to have her on the roster, but I'm disappointed if she ends up going there. I think that she is somebody who would be a better fit in WWE. I think AEW could use her. I think it would have been fun to see her even just reprise her role as all this is heavy in WWE. She's a great performer, and I'm looking forward to seeing where she lands. But I don't think it's going to harm anybody right now if she goes to AEW. She can always go to WWE later. I, I'm i less as like, oh, man, they really can't catch a win right now because look at all the shit they got going on. Of course, people probably aren't clamoring to put that jersey on. You know what I mean? I don't blame them if that's... Like, you know, if Camille was like, I, I don't want to join this company because of the whole Vince thing happening at the moment. But if it ends up being that they're just still not wanting to sign people, like we've heard before that it was like, well, they just put everything on hold and they just don't want to put out any money for anybody. Then that would be really frustrating because it's like, man, God, like just fucking you got to you can't act like everybody's going to be around forever. And then you end up getting mad because those people are not in their prime anymore you know like you gotta jump on it when you can otherwise 
you know, Jay White's in AEW and, uh, you know, this Camille thing right now. And we're going to talk about Mercedes and Will Ospreay and all these other people. Like, are you going to do that with Okada? Are you going to do that with uh, Julia? Are you going to do that with <laughs> every single person that potentially comes through here? Because I think that that's a mistake if that ends up being the case. As, as someone who hasn't really watched, I've seen bits and pieces of Camille. Somebody that just will not watch the NWI under any circumstances whatsoever. Um, it's hard to really say if this is a like. I assume she's a would be a good addition to the AEW women's roster. So let's see how it goes. I mean, they're clearly, as we will discuss later, they're investing a lot more into the women's division there. They've got some really talented names, and so just trying to stack it up with more and more people and more and more talented people, I think, is a good move for them. I think, yeah, it does like sting, will sting a little bit for WWE because they are seemingly losing out on pretty much every free ag- top free agent battle there is. The only real big signings they're making are people that were previously in WWE and, you know, Kyrie recently and Julia probably from stardom at some point, but yeah, they're, they're seemingly um, losing the bigger battles. For, like they lost on Jay White, they lost on Will Ospreay. We don't know where our card is going just yet, but we'll see. We'll see which way that falls. Let's say we'll talk about Mercedes later on. Seemingly they've lost down Camille, they lost down Dion Prazo. So, so yeah, it just seems like the wrestler's choice right now is to go to AEW, and whether that's financially motivated, whether it's that they feel like they'll get more opportunities there than they will in WWE, because WWE does have a, a very well established top order of the women's division. And maybe in a way this is actually would be somewhat in WWE strategy because argue, you could argue that three of their biggest stars right now in terms of just people like buzzing and talking about them, CM Punk, Cody Rhodes and Jade Cargill are all, all big deals because they're in AEW. So maybe they're almost using AEW as a feeder system for them in a weird way. Maybe. I mean, they could just have the philosophy of, well, we'll pick them up eventually when they've gotten more reps over there and they can see that the grass is greener over here or something. And we don't have to put them through the performance center system as much or whatever. Maybe they're even, you know, yeah, I know you've been saying for a while that you think that they might be having a little bit of cold feet on, uh, on Cargill. Maybe they're looking at that as like, wow, we had to put in some effort here. Maybe we don't want to do that with other, other people or something. Well, well, I think that it's it's changed a little bit now. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, do you, did that change after the Rumble? Well, they're clearly going to do something with her. I don't know what it is yet because she still has, like, she's appeared on TV a couple of times, but she still hasn't actually done anything outside of the Royal Rumble appearance yet. So we we'll have to wait and see on that front. I don't think that, I mean, fundamentally, if they look at AEW and think that these guys can't work, then they're a lot of these guys can't work or some of the people that have been signed or potentially will be signed they think oh they're not worth the the money or the time then i don't know what their scouting department is look like I, I fundamentally i think that they're just investing more into this um nil next in line system they want to create their own talent from athletes and teach them the the ww way of doing things and i think they see that as the the win as as the the pipeline moving forward and I, I'm, I am personally, I would be in favour of it. I mean, you definitely, you should still be signing some independent talent because they have more like experience and can do some cool things. But they're clearly trying to differentiate themselves. Like this is the WWE way of doing things. We take raw, like, well, well, I say well known, but like raw athletes from different areas of the sporting world, and we convert them into wwe superstars and then you can leave the more like traditional independent talent to the likes of aew tna other places like that instead well if we're talking about people that they uh are picking up in different places we certainly got to talk about aew (laughs) with their upcoming big business show it's going to be in td garden boston massachusetts on march 13th and it is effectively what we were talking about before which was hey what if they do something where they say it's going to be mercedes martinez uh mercedes martinez well uh mercedes monet 
Uh, different Mercedes. Uh, Mercedes Monet. But we can't say it's her, or we don't want to say it's her. We want to give you that like buzz of what if the same way that they did with CM Punk. And I mean, they they're making it as blatantly obvious as they possibly can that that's what it is. Because you know, I mean, they've that's got with two S's. It's Boston with you know, dollar, uh, signs, for the dollar signs. It's got, you know, it's in the TD Garden of Boston. When did we most recently see like uh, a picture of her even? It was her in front of the TD Garden and all. Big business. Like it, it's as obvious as it could possibly be. So uh, Sasha Banks heading over there on March 13th. That's post revolution for anybody that's like, you know, thinking that the big surprise will be like something a revolution or whatever. Of course, they could still have some other people in the mix, too. Like, I know that um, I forget if, who which one of you two had brought it up, but the idea of potentially combining that in with the whole Rainmaker thing of uh, hey, Okada. Could. Like, I think that would be even crazier. You know, like, imagine. Yeah, OK, we're telling you you're getting Mercedes, but we're also going to give you the Rainmaker because you took Okada and let's just go crazy. It'd be a great year. Yeah, I, I personally wouldn't do debut both on the same night because even if it is like you could do, you could try and recreate uh, all out twenty twenty one with that stuff. But I think that you should. What I, what I would do if if you are bringing Okada in, Okada is coming. Then I would debut. I would have Okada arrive in AEW and the big announcement at Revolution, and then his first match would be at big, big, at big business instead um then you can debut the Sadie rob and have the debuts clash with each other yeah i still am hoping that he goes to wwe just because i want to see him against like gunther and all but um at the very least it seems like they have her locked in and if they did but- have him in there i do think it's kind of if you do two big things like that on the same night one steps on the other one we'll talk about an announcement that just happened uh, yesterday that nobody's talking about because it's swallowed up by other things but, um but but um i think that obviously this is this is great news for a multitude of reasons obviously for AEW's women's division because Mercedes Monet is a great women's wrestler one of the greatest in the world she's clearly a, a huge star and they're going to make her a big star but also because of the reported like money that she'll be making and just how yeah how how big of a deal that they're making this saying it's one of, gonna be one of the biggest nights in aw history i know that's like you know that's the kind of like tony khan uh rhetoric that always happens anyway but they're, they're making this as a huge deal it means that if you're signing someone of that caliber and that probable size of contract you can know you have to push them you have to feature them on every show you have to make them a big big deal and by virtue, you make the women's division a really big deal. This is the Rousey, this is the Ronda Rousey effect when she signed with WWE. And mm-hmm. It's going to come to AEW instead. And I'd say that she has to be the most, well, she will be the most prominently featured one, but it means that hopefully everyone around her gets leveled up in the same, at, at, at the same time. So, yeah, I think that this is a, this is a really good move. How soon do you think she wins the belt? <laughs> I'd say at least by All In. If not at All In, then before that. And then she'll be champion going into All In. I don't I, know, because I, I, I have faith in Diana winning this belt soon, too. I think that Tony Storm is is retaining at Revolution. Yeah. Um, at the moment. Very heavily leaning towards well, Tony Storm now, retaining. Now that you say that, though, I just remember it didn't... Tony do the whole thing during the press conference of like, yes, there is a free agent and she's got money written all over her. So maybe they just they, yeah. they just save it for Mercedes. Well, I just think that Tony Storm, whether we are like enjoying the gimmick or not, she is clearly the top women's star in AEW right now, and the top one of getting like fan in, fan engagement. So I think that that's the biggest women's match you can do right now. We'll see how it actually ends up working in practice because they do have a ranking system now in place again. So I guess they have to give Mercedes wins in order to have her qualify as the number one contender for the title. They can't just 
well, they could, obviously. They can do whatever they want, but it seems like it goes against the rankings just have Mercedes come in and then her first match is fighting for the title. I think they... So so I think they they need to give her an interesting first match up, but it doesn't it shouldn't be against the champion. It should be against a a, a, a well established name, but not someone who is a current title holder. Someone like a a Chris Statlander or a um, I know Britt Baker or something along those lines. Have have that be your first marquee match with her, and then use that have a couple of other wins, and then she's fighting Tony Storm at double or nothing. So. Not that I think it would be the best. The first night? Do you think she's like, nah, not nah. at all. No, she just comes. She just comes out and she just ends up being like, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a boss bitch, and you know, I'm gonna <laughs> kick some ass. Like that's been like cuts a promo about like that. Well, this, that is like it's not like punk. As much as we talk about punk, it's it's not seven years. It's like less than a year because she was out injured. You know, so. I I think you could have her wrestle, but I like the idea of Britt Baker being. the first. I don't think this would be the best match, but I think maybe Soraya. It would, it would, I mean, there's there's a built in story there between those two. Mm-hmm. Like as soon as. Uh, Monet pops up and it's like, you know, she's talking a big game about how great she's going to be and how she's got that title on uh, her sights and all. One of the first people to come up and be like, I don't fucking want you here. <laughs> Could be Saraya to be like, yeah, you put me out of commission for all this, these years. I've got an issue because you got to assume she's probably coming in as baby face or at least baby face esque. Yeah, because they play a little bit more into the gray areas in AEW, and they're more willing to let somebody just be who they are and kind of feud with like heels and faces and all. But she's going to get pops. She's going to be somebody that they really focus on as like featured star baby face ish. So put her up with a, a heel like Soraya, and they can have a little feud over um, you know the beef between them like that, and then you can move on to somebody like a Baker or have her in matches with like. I don't know, any any number of different people. Have her beat lower totem pole people like Abaddon and, um, you know, the Renegades and whatever in the meantime, and then uh, work her way up to a Baker, work her way up to the title. And the uh, the Wembley show's August, right? Late August? Yeah, Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, Yeah, it'll be Bank Holiday weekend, I think, in August for us. So, yeah, I think that's... uh, I should know because I'm going, but uh, I don't have the exact date yeah. in my head <laughs> well, at the moment. So that's last over week, over five week, months. Yeah, there's yeah, there's plenty of time. I would say I'm not saying that she'll nec- I I think that she'll be in the title match at right. all in. I just don't know whether she'll be champion going into it or she will be challenging at that show. I think that um, I mean my ideal scenario is that it's her against Jamie Hayter at all in when Jamie comes back. Even more so than um, Hater and Storm. Well, yeah, because I'm like at that at that point, Mercedes is the biggest deal. I know that you need to do the Storm and Hater match at some point to like kind of tie a bow on that whole rivalry. But I think you could do that as a number one contenders match leading into all in. Yeah, I think so. By the time that well, we don't know exactly when Hater is going to come back, but Hater can come back, go after Tony Storm, especially if it's like. Mercedes has already won that belt. Oh, Hater always... goes after Storm and they have their little, you know, recap feud. And then that puts Hater on the path towards uh, fighting Mercedes. I almost think that you could do, I mean, again, it depends because I don't know what her um, current medical status is. But I would almost try and like subvert it a little bit on the at the big business show by having... Like Tony Storm, let's say, cutting a promo in the middle of the ring and just celebrating how great she is and beating everyone. I'd have Jamie Hayter come out to confront her first. And then people are a little bit, oh, a bit confused. I, I thought this would be Mercedes coming out now. And oh, it's actually Jamie Hayter's back, and that's great. And then have Mercedes come out. And then you basically have those two stare off at each other, like Jamie and uh, Mercedes. And then you've like, okay, 
both of us are after the biggest prize right now. And then it's just like almost like a race between those two to who can get to Tony first. And then you build up a little bit of animosity between those two straight away. You don't blow it off immediately. I'd say you could even do it if you wanted to do that as like a number of contenders match down the road or or save it until an all-in match. But just plant the seed between those two before one of them goes after like um, Tony and wins the title. As I say, that would be my ideal thing. Is like one of those two would be holding the title and then they'd, they'd have a match at all-in. Because I think that's the perfect blend of having your top female star for the future now and your top British female star competing against each other. That's perfect for a Wembley audience. And I mean, we know that Banks is perfectly capable of being able to be the heel there. So Mm. she could be the champion leading into that and then drops it to hate her. And then people get the cheer for the British star beating the heel champion. And, you know, it works out pretty well like that. So who knows yeah, what we're going to get over the next couple of months. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been um, like a bit more higher up on the women's division in AW. I think they've clearly, they clearly knew, I mean, based on what um, Sean Rossap and uh, Andrew Zarian have been reporting that uh, Mercedes has been signed for about a month now. For AW. And, they, and at least according to uh, Meltzer's reporting, they said that, uh, that it would have been announced earlier that this stuff was happening, but then the Vince stuff got in the way and they didn't want to announce that amid the height of the Vince news. So, so yeah, there's like, so she seems to have been locked in for a while now and they're just waiting for, they've, they've now chosen, this is the this is the day, this is the time that you're going to see her first time. And yeah, I think they've been, they've been steadily preparing the women's division for it by giving them a bit more time, a, a bit more focus. So, but yeah, I'm hopeful that this is just the the start of a much bigger and better future for that division in total. Well, on that topic, we need to talk about a division and its future for the women in a completely different way. But this is something that you're definitely going to be way, 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 way more knowledgeable about than I am. So you're going to have to um, kind of take the reins on this. But the situation with stardom and uh, Bushi Road and... Rossi Agawa, a name that I honestly don't think I had ever really heard before this whole story broke out. That's how little I know about stardom, but now that you've been more invested in stardom recently and you know, you're obviously way more tapped into that new Japan, uh, kind of scene. What's going on here? <laughs> so for those that do not know, Rossi Agawa was the founder of stardom. Uh, and he's been the, the head booker of the promotion ever since then. Um, they eventually got tied up with Bushi Road in the same way New Japan has as well. So, But essentially, he's been the head guy at Stardom ever since they started back in, I think, uh, like 2009, around about that point. So they've essentially what happened in the build-up to this is that he had already given Stardom a few months ago his noticed that he was going to be leaving and he was going to start up his own promotion and then they had so basically a load of people knew that he was already going to be leaving at some point but then they had their recently had their i think 13th anniversary show like this big special show they did in a in yeah like january or well, actually early february sorry i know it's february now so i'm just trying try to remember the timeline of all this stuff and then he was just immediately fired following that show by Bushi Road, with the accusation being that he was poaching talent from stardom to start his new promotion with. So it essentially, because all pretty much the vast majority of stardom contracts expire in March. So the idea was that Bushi Road were accusing him of talking to the stardom wrestlers that would have their contracts expiring soon and saying, hey, you should come and join me. I'm starting up the new promotion are going to be doing this that and the other i want you to be part of my roster rather than waiting until he was gone had the thing set up and then could start talking to them as free agents so that's his that's their accusation he's denied that um but essentially it's ended up being rossi gal is very very well respected very well liked by a large proportion of the stardom roster there is a belief that there's going to be at least a, a a somewhat exodus of the stardom roster to go sign up with 
a gal or whatever this new promotion is going to be called. It's not going to be everyone from Stardom because, at least by certain reports, a lot of the kind of lower card talent, the younger talent in Stardom, have already signed up to new contracts or agreed to new contracts, so they'll be sticking around. People like Mayu Iwatani, who's the kind of ace of Stardom, is on a longer-term contract past um, March of this year because she has a um, a movie coming out in Japan about her her life and her story in wrestling which is like being supported by Bushi Road. So she's been tied to a longer contract because of that, which is apparently like not, not great on her because apparently she's very upset with the whole situation, mm. which is not great if your top star is pretty angry about how all this has been handled. Um, Tam Nakano, who's one of the um, former like stardom world champions, has already said that she's going to be staying with stardom as well. So, But there are certain other people... We don't know for certain yet. Apparently, the uh, Bushi Road had set a deadline of February of today, February the ninth, uh, as we record this, saying uh, by by this date you need to inform us whether you are going to be re-signing with us or you're going to be leaving at the end of your contract because we need to figure out what we're going to do with championships, what we're going to do with long term booking moving forward. They've assigned two new people to the uh, head of bookers, replace Rossi Ogawa, and none of them have any wrestling background. Well, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, which might be. I mean, well, it's not the end of the world. Like, me, you know, sometimes people that don't have a wrestling background might have some good ideas, but typically speaking, that's a little bit risky. Yeah. So, so yeah, we'll, we'll see who would end up joining her. We know we know that one person that's going to be joining uh, Rossi Gower in his new promotion is Julia. Uh, Julia has said that uh, she is. She's going to delay her move to WWE, which is still happening and still is an inevitability at this point. But she will delay that in order to help Rossi Gower for a couple of months to launch this new promotion, have a few big matches, have a few like standout things. And then once it's established and all up and running, she will then go to WWE. Which is so, like, you know, I think it's a pretty honorable thing to do if we've got that oh, history yeah. to them. And I Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, I to say that um, everyone is there. There is such a huge loyalty among the Stardom roster towards Rossi Ogawa because many of them believe like he gave them their opportunity, their start. So I think that yeah, she's she's going to be repaying that faith that he put in her. And WWE is pretty good on saying you know if you have any kind of previous contract stuff that you should honor it instead of just being like nah, screw those other people were bringing you in and also. Seems like we're going to have to wait on Julia, which is also like if we stop seeing that NXT thing that's been like the three faces and all, then that would be kind of like, oh, I guess that's for her. I, I don't think it's necessarily for her. Um, I think it's for maybe Okada, maybe somebody else, though. But um, I, I hope I hope they wouldn't. They would. If Okada is going to WWE, I hope they would at least see sense and not put him in NXT. It's tough to say because, like, they very easily could just do that based off of the way that they've t- treated, like, Nakamura and Tomo Joe and Bobby Roode and all. But I would hope that they would just put them on the main roster because, like, NXT is fine. They don't need them. Put them on the main roster and just have him learn the style through house shows and stuff, you know? It's not like he can't wrestle. He just can't wrestle exactly the way that you want him to do where you're, like, look at the camera over here type of thing. I'll pick it up. Yeah. So I would have thought that um, these, these are, uh, well, I guess, uh, vignettes for NXT wouldn't be related to Julia because presumably, because well, she already knew that Rossi Agawa was going to be leaving prior to this abrupt firing. So I presume she was, or she'd already told them that she was planning on helping him set up this promotion a while ago. So I presume that was just part of the negotiation saying, yeah, I'm not going to come in straight away. So, Probably. So I presume that's never been related to her. I assume it's someone else. I have no idea who that person might be. I don't know whether it's another Japanese star who's leaving or his contract expiring soon, or it's somebody who's worked in Japan that's going to be utilizing that as part of their gimmick. I'd said like Tamatonga maybe, because we know that he's his contract expired recently. So, so yeah, that's pretty much the situation in Stardom. There's, I, I know that um, this brought out um, Twitter Tony Khan, yeah, what bit. I didn't double check around about that, but I heard that some people were like pissed about something that he had said. What did he put out there? So essentially, he tweeted out um, 
some sort of gif. I can't remember the exact gif, but it's then it was just curb like, your enthusiasm, the big goodbye, and he's like, "Bye, Rossi," and it's like, but I, even I had to be like, I don't know what the purpose is here. So, so the whole speculation around that is that uh, Tony Khan believed that uh, Rossi Gale was kind of the block between. Uh, AEW booking some stardom wrestlers for shows. They, apparently, they wanted to have stardom talent appear at uh, the latest Forbidden Door, but then stardom had a pay per view going on on the same exact day. So I don't know. I presume that wasn't an intentional swipe on AEW. It was just a case of okay, we're just going to be booking our own show that day, so we can't do it. But there have been other instances where they have wanted to get stardom talent in, but that's been refused. And then there was also apparently an agreement to try and to send uh, Chris Statlander for a short period over to stardom. And uh, but apparently that was around about the time that her knee blew out for the second time. So that ended up falling through. We've obviously had Megan Bain, who's signed to AEW, but has been working with stardom. So that's maintained. But clearly... Um, there is a lot of bad blood between Tony Khan and Rossi Agawa in terms of how he thinks the business was conducted between the two of them. And then he then also put out a tweet suggesting that uh, uh, Rossi Agawa was working for, uh, was a mole for WWE. <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, well, the whole idea... That was, a, that was a real thing that was going around, though. Yeah, that, there was speculation around about that because of the whole... You know how those reports were going about about how um, AEW wasn't interested in Julia and how that was that that was the reason why the WWE pretty much had no competition going towards uh, a lot of, that that tweet came out and then people start thinking oh maybe it wasn't that they weren't interested it was due to the fact that essentially Rossi Gale was saying okay WWE gets first look in on talent from Stardom and. Then if they're not interested, then then they maybe can talk to AEW or any other places. But not so much being like, you know, a direct mole into WWE, but essentially saying we'll give WWE. Yeah, we'll we'll favorite yeah, we'll give WWE the first choice. That's why like things like Kyrie Sane getting the uh, she would have gone to WWE pretty much anyway, but you know, c- circumstances like that. Apparently they were uh, yeah, so I actually I don't know any other like major rumors surrounding it, but um, Milton came out and said that Agao is not going to WWE. He's starting his new promotion in Japan. It's not going to be an NXT Japan thing. So, so I think that yeah, I think I think that it's just that they they clearly Rossi Gower and Tony Khan don't get on, and it's clear that at, at the very least there won't be any crossover between AEW and this new promotion that he founds. But because of the Bushi Road and obviously the relationship between New Japan and AEW, there might be more of an opportunity for stardom talent to go over to AEW. Although apparently a lot of the people are quite upset with um, Tony Khan right. for the uh, for the tweets that he made and basically celebrating a gal was firing because even if people are staying with stardom, they are still loyal to a gower, and so they probably won't be too happy with the fact that they're basically celebrating his uh, his demise. But I mean, I think that that's something that will hurt for a while like a few months even maybe a year or so and then more eventually people just move on and realize there's money to be made so what shining star type of name is he going to give this because every single women's promotion seems to be based off of that like shine stardom glow wow <laughs> like it's all shiny and like a uh, star based or something what other kind of call this one sparkle or something i mean i mean the the other major ones in japan right now are like tokyo joshi pro and got ice ribbon and uh things of that ilk but uh yeah i have no idea what she what's here he's not he's uh he would potentially name this new promotion there's been no um no hints or anything like that going around but uh, it will be interesting to see which which ones in particular he manages to s- snipe away from stardom or what other uh, freelance talent in Japan he's able to bring in. Bring in. So, so yeah, I guess in a way it's it's good because it gives people more places and opportunities to work. In other ways, both promotions are going to get hurt as a result of this. Like he's not going to get everyone from stardom, and stardom are going to lose some big names. So. So basically, this is all. This is 
in many ways a lose lose situation. I just hope it's not a mass exodus situation where, like, All Japan used to be the top Japanese promotion and they never recovered from the birth of Noah and that exodus. You know what I mean? I doubt it'll be like a full scale thing. I think um, there's been like speculation that I think that about maybe half a dozen to a dozen names might move over. It's not, um, as I said, that, as I said earlier, they've kind of tied up some of the younger talent, so they're going to try and keep the that that base of up and coming talent to help them grow. And I- Iwatani's not going anywhere, and Nakano's not going anywhere, so that's two big names they're keeping hold of. Um, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. I imagine that at least a couple of big names and a couple of existing champions will go over with him. So if we're talking about that's that's where you are right now. Yeah. If we're talking about that, a very similar kind of story (laughs) is happening in TNA right now. Because Scott Demore was fired from TNA through uh Anthem uh having a little bit of a you know tiff over a bunch of different things. It seems like Scott Demore offered to buy out the company and then they decided to, you know, not accept that offer and then now uh, the president of entertainment from Anthem, Anthony Saccone, is uh, taking over in his stead. And there's quite a bit of people, it seems, that are upset about Scott Demore leaving. And, of course, a lot of people are going like, oh, is he going to go to WWE? Is he going to be brought in in that way? And, uh, of course, I am not um, super duper familiar enough with like the ins and outs of TNA either, since I haven't been watching that all these years and stuff, but you know, Scott Demore is a name that I've heard a million different times. And I got to assume that somebody like a Jordan grace, for instance, that would be a little bit more loyal to keeping herself around Scott Demore and TNA might at this point be like, you know what? I really wish I could just leave and just go right to WWE at this point or something. And there's probably going to be a handful of people that don't want to stick around in TNA anymore with this new regime. And, yeah, it could be good stuff. It could be bad stuff, but it does seem like it's a bit of a blow to that crew. Yeah. yeah. Um, go ahead, Cal. No, no, you, you you know more about the TNA situation than me. I'll let you. I, so, I let the start one. You can go with the TNA one. So outside of a certain wrestling journalist, really suggesting that there's more to this in terms of nefarious means it just seems like hey demore was really happy with the progress of tna he put in an offer to buy the promotion they kind of turned him down and then said you know what and we want more control of it historically that's never boded well when it comes to professional wrestling organizations but also, you know, they are going to integrate some things. So maybe we do see better production. So on the TNA side of things, from a fan, I'm willing to let it play out and see how this goes. It does seem like the performers were blindsided, however. And I have not seen anybody say anything but, like, show massive love and praise for Scott on uh, social media so this could be a problem and this sucks too because it's right as everybody was just super hyped for tna and they already have another thing you know that is taking away from that i again willing to let it play out i think it's weird that they're already going back to vegas for their april pay-per-view after they just ran the same venue january hopefully it's just a, a rough patch that leads to more smooth sailing, but I, I, I don't know. It's a very turbulent time in wrestling, and I really wish that they could have figured out how to just let them more buy the company, but at the same time, maybe they're going to go live on Access. Is Access a great channel? Not necessarily when you look at the ratings, but it is a channel that they can always guarantee to be on because they're owned within the same family. 
Uh, there's a lot of moving parts here. Yeah, I mean, it's just like been a crazy start of the year because in the past, like seven weeks or so, the the presidents or sort of the biggest names of the top of set four of the top seven promotions in the world have all gone away now. <laughs> like, like first New Japan, then WWE, then Stardom, and now TNA. It's only AEW, CMLL, and AAA that haven't had a big shift at the top. But um, yeah, this one just seems to come out of out of all of them seem to come out of nowhere the most. Like everything seems to be going TNA's way a little bit. They've got some real momentum going with them. And yeah, just in all positivity, get the original branding back, have this big show, get guys like Will Ospreay and Okada to appear on your shows. And then then you lose the guy who's kind of been at the heart of all of this. And yeah, that it's got a lot of people rattled seemingly. There's uh they said that there was like this call that uh, like a talent call that happened with Gail Kim and the to- was it Tommy Dreamer involved in that one as well? Yes. Can't remember. But yeah. And then a lot of people that apparently had to like mute a load of people on the call because everyone was shouting over the top of each other of like how things were going on. Uh, yeah, I think that this is gonna this is this one in particular. I think is gonna blow up in TNA's face quite a bit. Like this is the thing. This is this is the way of the TNA. This is you. You build up positive goodwill, <laughs> and then everything blows up around you. And so, so yeah, I mean, yeah. One step this, forward, two steps back. Exactly. This is this is what happens, and they will survive it because they always do. But it will just be, you know, you do so well, and you get everyone. Well, I say everyone, but you get a lot more people on side, and people excited about your product for the first time in ages, and then, and then you just make this huge change at the top in terms of creative direction. And my, my, well, as I say, would see what the actual total fallout of this, whether it is just, you know, a case of Scott DeMore wanted to either take power for himself and buy out the company and basically run it himself, or he wanted to just, like, invest more money into the company and they said, no, we're going to try and downsize a little bit and we'll take over instead. We'll downsize by uh, removing your contract yeah. to start with. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I think that... Uh, uh, yeah, we'll see if there's anything else that comes out in the wash about that. But provided that those are the only circumstances behind his abrupt firing, I could see uh, just cause for someone either in WWE or AEW to maybe look at Scott DeBoer as a potential signing. Depending on where these companies could fit him, I mean, WWE is always looking for more people to be producers. And they pull people into the production thing that like some stuff seems pretty obvious. Like, you know, we've been talking for years about like, uh, Hey, Drew Gulak seems like he would be a fucking amazing performance center coach. And, you know, Jason Jordan ended up becoming a producer after his injury. And somebody like a Bobby Roode is producer now. And, you know, Nick Aldis comes in and whatever. And, you know, they, could very easily go in like the Jeremy Borash type of way by bringing Scott Demore in and doing something like that. But maybe NWA even wants to do something with him or maybe, uh, you know, the AEW wants to mess around a little bit more with their setup because they've been doing that quite a bit this past year and everything ranging from like the merch stuff to, you know, global vice president of blah, blah, blah type of positions that everybody looks at and goes, what the fuck does that even mean? So I don't know. I could see him bouncing back in a way that would make sense. And of course, if that whole story that there might be something to it, if there is something more to it, then that's a different story. But if it's just a matter of Anthem being like, well, we don't want you in charge anymore and we want to take control more and whatever, that's a different story. Um, But I I could see him, if he's well liked and he did a good job building that company back up and keeping it from death, if I'm another company that's out there, I'm going to at least consider talking to him about something. Maybe he's got some ideas about these other companies too. So what we're saying is global force wrestling (laughs) with Scott Demore and Jeff Jarrett and we can maybe Dixie Carter too. Like maybe bring him in to 
run ROH so Tony Khan doesn't have to spend time on it? That's never going to happen. I'm okay. I'm now convinced that they like the way the Ring of Honor is going and they like what it provides for their promotions. And I don't think he's ever just going to give it away to somebody else. No, I don't think like give it away, but you think that there's no chance that he would even like appoint somebody he, as sort of the he's done quote unquote general hero. manager. I think he's done that with hero and I don't think uh, any more is going to get done than what already has been. I think he, um, he tried to, um, to see power and influence, uh, and that's when, uh, you know, the dark order, that dark order attacking the elite segment back in the uh, 20 in like 2019 happened. And then from that moment on, he went, yeah, I think I'm just going to take care of everything from this. But point it, on. it's sort of you for you better and for point, worse. You do hit a point where it's sort of like, all right, you got cheated on. At some point, you should try dating again. You know, it's like I'm not, I'm not saying thing? that you, I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I mean, and Scott Demore would be a good name to I'd say like the stuff that happened in TNA. A lot of people have said how much better TNA come. I, I'd say I'm not. I'm one of those people that's quite happy with the way Ring Bond is going right now. But um. But yeah, I'd say it's it's worth having an influence there, especially if he's if having someone like that around. I'm saying this for both WWE and AEW's perspective. If having a guy like that around who's built positive relationships with a lot of the top TNA talent, that's a good p- potential pipeline of bringing that talent into your own promotion one day. Yeah, and the more connections that you have with that, the better that it is for you could just be like, well, reach out to that person that you know and tell them that we are interested in, in them doing that. And then, you know, kind of greases the wheel a little bit. I think that makes a lot of sense. It all matters, of course, partially, you know, whether there is something more to it than that. Um, oh yeah. I, that's I'm just a speaking, guarantee. I'm, I'm speaking in the circumstance of whether he, whether like it's just a case of just, there's yeah, that there's nothing else to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Should something nefarious come out solidly, then yeah. You know, same thing like we say with Vince. Boom. But until then, it does seem like this could cause a rift in DNA. It definitely does not come off as a positive whatsoever. Like, I can't imagine that people in TNA are sitting there going, wow, the guy that we felt like was our champion that brought us back from the brink is gone. Yay. <laughs> you know, like that doesn't equate to uh, anything that makes sense in my mind. Um, so I don't know, maybe that's going to be another one of those like big stories that happens this year where we end up seeing him popping up in another promotion and he ends up being a big part of that. And the next thing we know, it's kind of like, uh, Hey, if it wasn't for him getting released, we wouldn't have this and that, or there's something going on. I don't know, but, um, crazy time with people coming in and out of companies and, the power shifts and all that the past couple of years have been nuts with that. And it's so hard to keep track of all these things, but Hey, if you are following WWE, we know at least, uh, when it comes to power shifts and stuff, we got the, the press conference thing that happened. And that's as big of a power shift as you can get <laughs> for these things. Some little stories that happened before we get into the you know big finale of that, uh, they didn't really touch upon this in the same way as uh, some of the other things, but it is something that's tied a little bit into it. 2K24 has a few extra little stories for this week. One of them being Muhammad Ali is going to be in the game. It's pretty interesting. And you know what? I think it's kind of overdone. Uh, overdue. Not overdone. Like, no, they've been doing it in every uh, game or something. But it makes sense. They were really harping this year on, you know, 40 years ago, WrestleMania happened and talking about the history of all that and Muhammad Ali in the game isn't something that's going to make me buy the game by any means, but that's pretty neat. Yeah, I think it's super cool. I think he can, they can maybe throw him in the, the showcase mode as the referee for that match. Um, I think it's cool in general. I know that he also has another reaction figure, so maybe they just have kind of a deal date. Uh, great move for the game can create a lot of fun dynamics you know the boxer versus wrestler stuff isn't as prevalent now with mma but it's always fun to revisit 
yeah, I think his it's his inclusion in this is yeah, it's definitely a good move, and I presume it's it's a big part of the the push they're doing for the new the, the return of the guest refer, special referee mode. So I assume he'll be part of that. Now we also know that there's a change to one of the covers, where Brock Lesnar is no longer on it. And this makes perfect sense based off of the Vince McMahon stuff going on and Brock Lesnar being tied into all that. All they really did was they shifted the people on there. They didn't add anybody else to replace him or anything. But hey, when uh, Triple H was doing the whole big intro on this uh, press conference and he's like, you know, legends over the years like uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin and... uh, Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker and John Cena. And it's like, not Brock Lesnar. Don't talk about him. Like, <laughs> it makes it'd sense. Be, it'd be really weird when um, The Undertaker streak is broken by Bob Wagner. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be weird when they just don't. Yeah, even though I, I do think that they're going to include him still. I just think that they don't want to market him as a cover athlete. Yeah. Now keep him it's, in the game because you're gonna have to put more time and effort to like get the developers to take him out, and maybe he's a part of the Road to WrestleMania storyline or something where that would be too much of a hassle to do that. Oh yeah, he's got to be featured in at least two or three of the matches they have. It's, again, they did 30 years of WrestleMania a decade ago, and you know what hadn't happened yet? The Undertaker streak being broken. Yep. So that's <laughs> one of the pivotal moments in wrestling history. And not only that, but if you don't do the Undertaker streak being broken from a game standpoint, you can't do WrestleMania 30 at all. You can't do Brian. Maybe you do Cena and Wyatt. Maybe pivot to that, but it's not as impactful. And they're already doing the Firefly Funhouse. But yeah, I think Brock will still be in it. And I think will these people ask we see him? I'm hearing a lot of people say that. And it's it's so funny because he, again, he's not named in Janelle Grant's lawsuit. It's just It's implied. Boy, that's enough of a descriptor that only one human being on the planet fits this description. Ali. It's um, like uh, we don't want to say that uh that it's Brock Lesnar. So how do we say he's a person who is from the UFC and the WWE and won their world title and was re-signing and it's like and okay. was a big name and somebody who's close with Vince and his name rhymes with block. <laughs> you know, so I, I don't know if we see him again because this could be something where maybe down the line he's able to just be like. I had no real involvement or it's enough of a thing that they just don't pursue him and you could see him again. There's a very real chance that Brock Lesnar's last match was against Cody Rhodes at SummerSlam. Could be. And, you know, there's worse ways to go out than that. But, of course, for many different reasons, it's, you know, you got to hope that maybe he wasn't involved in anything like that. Maybe that is blown out of proportion. Maybe... It isn't him. Maybe it's somebody else, but highly doubtful. Um, Because I still want to see that Gunther match. I still want to hope for people to be less than terrible people. And either way, taking him off the cover is a good decision. Right now, you don't need to have him on the cover. It's not going to do you any good. I think it's silly if they didn't replace him. You're going to sit here and tell me, like you, even you were running down that whole uh, legends like The Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, John Cena. Brock Lesnar is great. Don't act like Savage doesn't exist. Yeah, Savage being on there would have made more sense to me or, to just put like, him in there. You know, or Yoko, even well, maybe not Yoko in place of Brock, but you know, there's there's a lot of people that you put on there. You can put Cody on there. Why is it Cody on the 40 years <laughs> WrestleMania cover? Bianca and uh Rhea are. Or at least Bianca is. I think Putting Savage on there would have been the easiest solution outside of what they did, which was to just shift people on there. But the uh, so I'm going to be honest, the fact that he's not on there and the fact that I know for a fact the WrestleMania five representation is warrior and rude. I'm wondering if Savage is even in the game. 
Uh, he's got to be. You got to assume he that. is, right? You say that, but like, does he have to be? Maybe o- the only way I can see him being in the game is if it's like, hey, we're doing a Cody thing. He did fight Dusty at WrestleMania. So we got to get him in the game. Hmm. By the way, uh, using their smooth transition technology, which is where they, you know, go from in game footage to a uh, real footage. They blurred out Mean Gene. They blurred out the honky tonk man's face. It's really? So stu- it's so stupid, too, because you see Warrior pinning a guy who can only be the honky tonk man at SummerSlam 88. And it's like, God, you really just blur in his face just to avoid royalties. In that case, find another way to do it because this just looks petty, you know? <laughs> Put through the knockoff version that you see at like, uh, if you ever go to like a dollar store and you see toys and it's like it. instead of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, it's like mutant uh, karate, uh, karate turtle men, <laughs> frog men. <laughs> yeah, and so they're just like, oh, he didn't beat the honky tonk man. He beat um, Dr. Elvis. <laughs> yeah, it's um. Of course, WWE 2K24 is not something that I have any plans on making a big amount of content for on this uh, site and channel and all, since I'm not planning on playing the game, period. But yeah, maybe we end up having something tied into that with like the Discord channel. Maybe people want to like live stream that or, or do something. I don't know. So keep your eyes on uh, guys peeled out for that. Maybe we have some more to talk about in the future for that. And of course, when we do get information about like, people's standings and who's on the roster and who's not, then we probably will end up addressing that. Um, yeah. Future episodes. The, uh, other like oddball thing that they had said during this that I immediately was just like, Oh, nobody's going to give a shit about that whatsoever. And lo and behold, nobody gives a shit about that whatsoever (laughs) is WWE speed. We finally got some information about that after all this time where they have now said that that is coming to Twitter and that is going to be the setup of the five minute matches. They are just airing that on Twitter and it's not going to be, you know, elsewhere. Um, WWE speed is just the name of it. It's as you know, bland as can be. I still think that they, if they're going to go green and they're going to go speed, they should have just called it velocity. Not that I love the velocity name, but I already have it. Why call it no, WWE no. Speed? WWE Speed, and this is the only time I don't call it Twitter. WWE Speed on X cracks me up because it's just like WWE drugs. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> they might as well be WWE uh, LSD on PCP or something. Uh, I don't really have plans on watching this all that much. Oh, I, get over yourself. It's five minutes. If you can't watch it while you're taking a crap, what is wrong with you? It's five minutes long. Cedric that, Alexander needs work. Okay, that's five minutes that I could be spending doing almost anything else. And uh, now I, depending on when they air this and stuff too, like maybe that ends up being something that is worth putting on in the background. Maybe it's just going to be just as bad as main event is. Bro, what back? It's fi- literally Tony. It's five minutes. You can't spare five minutes? I can't. I don't have a square to spare. <laughs> no, sometimes five minutes is a lot in my day. Uh, it sounds ridiculous, but sometimes it is. And I don't think I'm planning on doing live coverage of this unless it ends up being something that they air like right before SmackDown or something. Because I don't believe that they've said when this airs, right? Um, so it starts in spring 2024. So I guess I, my guess you'll see a new match every Thursday. Why Thursday? Because Monday, Tuesday. <laughs> She's going to name the dates. Yeah, yeah, like Monday, Tuesday, Friday are taken. Wednesday's got the bump. The only thing that they don't really have is Thursday. They have main event on Hulu, but that's exclusive to Hulu, and nobody touches that. This is going to be exclusive to X, and nobody's touching it. I think what's more likely to happen 
based off of when they had recorded the little test footage of this and the fact that the WWE logo is uh, got the blue swoosh underneath it. I think they're going to record this prior to SmackDown. Well, that's a given. And that we're going to get it airing live no. prior to SmackDown. Nope. Live to, live to tape is what it's going to be. Oh, they've said specifically that it's going to be taped. So let me pull up the Hollywood Reporter has some more information on this. That it is a two year deal. And just like Raw SmackDown NXT, there will be speed matches 52 weeks a year. So we do know that they're at least getting like this isn't going away anytime soon. And I understand that because it, realistically, you just have to make sure to film one match that will go five minutes or less by the way depending on how much they want to record it in advance they could just do a taping wwe speed and it ends up being like especially if they want to do it at like the performance center or something my god they can knock out the entire year's worth of programming in a week if they wanted to so the uh the series which is planned to be live to tape Will debut this spring and will feature WWE superstars from across its roster. The content will be exclusive, meaning that they won't just be like, oh, um, this match on Raw was five minutes, so suck it, Twitter. Nope, you're getting an exclusive match every week, and you get new episodes 52 weeks a year. And, you know, this is huge. There's no word on how much they're getting paid here. But this is... Huge. WWE is attacking all forms of media right now. And I, uh, not to steal Hunter's line, but God, I wish that, you know, this was more of a time where you can go look at how they're growing, look at what they're doing. And instead, you've got the looming uh, black cloud of how much of a piece of shit Vince McMahon is. But hmm. this is cool. Like, th this is exciting. If this, if you established like a reason for this and maybe even a championship and you can use this to spotlight people like Ashanti the Adonis, uh, Cedric Alexander, Axiom, Scripps, this, this might work for Scripps. I gotta tell you, this might be really good for him. You know, this is a great way to get some underutilized talent on screen. And I think I'm willing to give it a shot. And again, a lot of that is because it's just five minutes. <laughs> WWE scripts coming soon to X. <laughs> <laughs> Drugs. <laughs> yeah, prescri uh, prescription scripts, right? That's what it is. Yes. Um, even though it's five minutes long, still not planning on watching it, right, Callum? Not particularly. <laughs> Five, yeah, minutes quite long. The same Five minutes is quite long for some of the women's matches on that show. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, didn't I think would about assume. The NXT women, he's got a, he's got a little bit of a point. I, I was thinking more about the like high flying men, but you could. This could be a great way to be like, hey, B Fab, go get reps. You know. Yeah, that's the real selling point, though. <laughs> if they're like, you get a five minute match, it's definitely going to be only five minutes. It's on Twitter, and we're going to be featuring B Fab. They no, need to make sure I, if they want people to actually tune into this, they need to make sure that they don't treat it the way that they treat main event and the way that they did superstars. Like they will, because there's no way they're going to do anything sustainably important going forward for it. We're not going to see a title match on there. Like, you know, I'm not sold uh, on that. I think Logan I think Paul's not defending. I think they'll create a speed championship. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like Logan Paul's not defending the U S title on that show. Or like oh. the tag titles aren't going to be on the line or anything. So it's not going to be like that. They might create the speed championship. And then that, depending on how much interest there is, maybe people get invested in that a little bit more than a 24 seven title, but it probably would be relatively close to that type of importance. And you're going to see people like, like Ashanti. You're going to see people like Cameron Grimes on there. It's not going to be, the top top guys. I don't think you're seeing a five minute AJ Styles match, for instance. I'm not sold on that. First of all, because maybe the first couple of weeks, but then I yeah, think they're going to gonna, say, like, they're going to eventually do what they did before with because main event had Undertaker in the first week. They wanted to get people to tune in, and then eventually yeah, they just stars. 
had done too. That's yeah, the same show. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like they treated that like it was supposed to be a deal, and then they very quickly went, "Fuck it, let's have uh, a nineteen match series between Mustafa Ali and." Uh, Tedrick or somebody. Okay, but, they, but again, they it was Ricochet. They clearly asked for that because again, if you have something like this where talents can be featured, I'm not expecting this to eclipse Raw. You know what I mean? We're not talking about. Oh man, this could be a really big deal. It's this is a, a great way to one. You're expanding your brand. Two, you're testing the waters with Twitter videos. Uh, three. Again, it's great for scripts. It's great for Axiom. It's, you know, a way to get maybe even uh, Cameron Grimes who just fuck all on the main roster. Like, he could be a fun speed championship guy. Uh, Charlie Dempsey. I can name people that I wouldn't mind watching for five minutes because <laughs> it's, um, you're not asking me to sit through a 25 minute scripts match with a story. You're asking me to sit through a very a series of maneuvers thing. for three and a half minutes. <laughs> and I, and I'm perfectly fine with that. And if you create a championship around it where, you know, going the distance might mean something. Yeah. You can play, like just play around with this. I think this can be really very positive. The WWE speed title. I don't like the sound of it, but at least we do know something's coming out of that speed taping that they had done. So, well, you know, realistically, and you could shift this and they would never do this, but wouldn't it be cool if it was like this week on WWE speed, we're going to stick Randy Orton in a ring. And we're just going to throw guys at him and see how many RKOs he can hit five minutes. <laughs> That'd be a really fun show. I'd be more interested to watch that, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so here is the uh, finale of this episode. Hang on. What? I'm not going to hmm? talk anything about this Dynamite episode at all. Oh, wait, yeah. There, well, were, fuck, there were some big fuck, things that happened Sting on that show. Fuck, the tag team <laughs> I thought we'd factor that more into revolution. But no, we gotta at least mention it. You can't just jump over it. I mean, didn't talk about Raw or NXT either. Well, no, nothing happened on that show. We're about to talk about Raw. <laughs> We're about to talk about the big thing from Raw, which is the fucking world champion getting crapped on. <laughs> yeah, that's press conference though. But yeah, the singer Darby Allen won the titles like we thought that they would. <laughs> there are two. I, I know you'd hate AEW, so I'll talk about it instead. So you, you, right, you can just calm down for a little bit. We'll get to your precious WWE in a second. Let's talk a little bit about AEW. So, so yeah, Sting and Darby became tag champions. I want to talk about the first thing that I thought. There are two big things that I thought were noble on the show. We can skip through, obviously, to catch Big Jericho and Tony Storm had a match. That's fine. Um, Adam Page is turning heel. That came out of nowhere, which is fun. They did the. They essentially did a double turn in there. Uh, third match between him and Swerve Strickland. They're going to have a triple threat match at Revolution for the title, as we expected. But the fact that they are going in this direction, they're really leaning into pages so psychotically obsessed with Swerve that he's turning heel off the back of that, and Swerve's turning babyface. That's that's cool. It's like a bitter he's accent. Really <laughs> yeah, yeah, essentially, yeah. He is going insane, and he's like one of those justified heels because essentially Swerve broke into his house and intimidated his baby. Well, it's worth so, well, that, well that, that, I actually, I actually, I actually saw that thing on Twitter. It said that if, officially he didn't actually enter his break into his house because any house that Swerve enters is now his house. Right. So that's so yeah, that's good. That's a good way of looking. That's it. But essentially, he's justified in yeah. This guy's did all that stuff to me, and now you're cheering him, and I just want to make sure that he's never world champion. Essentially, they're telling the story that Paige wants Swerve to be to not be world champion more than he wants himself to be world champion. So they're doing really well with that. So I didn't uh, like it because it's it would have made so much more sense with the story you've already told if Swerve just flipped the roles. He hits the buckshot and you know one, two bell rings. Because then he goes, you still ain't beating me. I'm actually number one on the rankings. You're number two. And I told you we're done after this. So we're moving on. 
I think, like, in, in theory, that should have been the way it goes, but they've just realised that Swerve's the baby face in this situation, or the crowd are just going to cheer Swerve in all these circumstances, so they decide to lean into turning Paige heel, which is which is fine. It's an interesting... We've never seen Paige as a heel in AEW, so... Only, like, tweener-ish heel. Yeah. Because, he, yeah. you know, he's had more than a few I'm frustrated and I'm going to act like a dick to people types of stories. Yeah, it does seem he's going full blown this time. So that'll be interesting. And then Sting and Darby Allen, as mentioned, won the AEW tag team titles in the uh, Tornado Tag match, which is, again, a really good match. It features the uh, greatest boss man slam in history. Yeah, that was <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, but arguably even more interesting at the end of it was the the post-match angle, which, as I say, we knew we were getting the Bucks and against uh, Sting and Darby Allen at, at Revolution. But the the way that they added so much heat into this match immediately, coming out in their completely white suits and uh, just getting Darby Allen's blood all over those white suits, beating up Sting, Sting's kids. I, I saw uh, Brian Alvarez describe them as um, they look exactly like Sting and yet don't look like each other. <laughs> 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 Which is true. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. So, so maybe they're different iterations of Sting. I've kind of seen some people saying one of them looks like Sting and the other one looks like um, fake Sting from, uh, <laughs> from WCW. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> NWO Sting or whatever that was, yeah. So, um, so, so yeah, beating them up as well just adds a lot more animosity going into it. And um, if people haven't seen Rampage, I'm not good. Well, it's not much of a spoiler. They, The Bucks come out. And they have their out their wrestling gear is now their their white suits. They have new music. They have a new Titan drawn. Oh, they do. Really? Yeah, they come out with they come out to Matthew and Nicholas Jackson now. And um, they beat two um, just random local jobbers in a squash match on Rampage, which means that they are essentially now going to fudge like um, I guess manipulate the rankings. By just beating crappy teams every single week to make sure Rich. they get title shot. What's Which the new um, entrance music? Do you know? It's um, it's 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 deliberately as douchey as they can make it. Hmm. <laughs> I'll probably end up liking it. <laughs> it's a uh, but, yeah, but yeah, it's um, they they're very much leaning into the EVP stuff now. So yeah, I just wanted to mention those things because I thought it was like it was a big ish episode of Dynamite. So also just, shout out to Takeshita for beating Jericho. I know you. Gl- you glossed over it a bit, but good. That was the right move. Yeah. Also, just as a thing with uh, Sting winning the tag titles, that's um, his twenty-fifth title that he's ever won. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's quite a nice than round. You would assume. Yeah, but it's yeah. A quite a nice round number to to end on twenty-five. So now we can talk about the uh, the well, press conference. But, but to carry on with that a little bit more, do you think that we're going to get? Uh, does this make you lean more towards Sting? retaining those titles and winning at revolution we will talk about it a little bit more or do you think that that kind of makes it a little bit more in jeopardy of like oh well, he's got to lose because he's got to lose the titles based on this they should retain because like you shouldn't end it on such a a negative note but it, it, it totally depends you know, uh, at they the, can always get their heat and then lose yeah i mean at the end i think that if they do lose sting would take the fall anyway so you're not like you're you're not hurting Darby Allen by having them lose the match. So, and yeah, you could get a lot of heat for it, but fundamentally, this is going to be the main event of Revolution. Yeah. By by, there's now zero doubt in my mind that this is the main event of Revolution. So maybe you do just end with Sting and Darby Allen win as champions, and then they relinquish the belts afterwards. I don't actually think people would be upset about that. Yeah, it's I'm not, glad we're not, coming around to that. It's not how I would necessarily do it, but I don't. If people aren't going to be upset about it, and it means that Sting gets to end on a high and just um, get celebrated by the crowd on his way out, then then yeah, I'm totally fine with it. All righty, so let's uh, let's, well, let's talk uh, about that press conference then. Well, let's start here because let's uh, let's talk about how Callum said the Young Bucks are leaning into the EVP thing. And without even getting into the press conference, I want to say my favorite thing was CM Punk absolutely advocating that punch motherfuckers in the face. 
He said it at least 10 times, and that was my favorite part of the press conference, even without all the cool shit that happened at the end of it. I like the image that's going around where people have like the shot of punk saying, you know, I'll punch anybody, even if my if it's my boss or whatever. And then it's the picture of Tony Khan underneath the where it's like, I fucking told you so. <laughs> or my favorite was, uh, I'll, I'll punch somebody. It doesn't matter if I have one arm, because if you remember the first one. He definitely had a torn tricep. <laughs> well, punk. Funny though. So here's what. Uh, here's my perspective of this whole thing. Um, I am heading back from the gym at the time, and I'm like, "Oh fuck! It's like seven o'clock. I gotta uh, put that on." So I got that on my phone, and I'm trying to like listen to that while walking back. And the big like thing that made me go like, "Oh, okay, cool," was when they say Big E's there. And yeah, New York is fucking loud and shit. So I can't really hear a whole lot of stuff, but I hear Big E say that like, he's doing pretty well. And like, he's very pro Cody and CM Punk's there. And uh, Big E made a funny joke where he's like, I'm only here to make sure that Punk doesn't do anything that gets him in trouble. Cause you got a track record and whatever. <laughs> I thought that was already pretty funny. And you know, they're kind of just like treating this like a pre-show of a pay-per-view. And I was like, this is kind of weird, this vibe but I'm kind of digging it at the same time because it was different than what I was expecting that it was going to be. I thought that it was going to be pretty much the press conference stuff that we see after the pay-per-views. Turns out nobody fucking had a chance to like ask any questions or anything. Like it was totally not the case. It was just an hour long video package, promo segment type thing. Um, But there were elements of this that I really liked a lot. And there are things that I made uh, maybe kind of laugh because I thought that it was kind of kind of stupid, <laughs> not like the biggest problems in the world and all. But for instance, they're like, hey, Bianca Belair, Belair's here. And she's like, I'm not doing anything at Mania, but I'm I'm here. So, you know, WrestleMania's got EST in it. I'm going to twirl my hair and see you later. <laughs> and I'm like, God damn, man, they just totally brought her out there specifically so they can, you know, be like, OK, well. She's a big star and she is going to carry herself well. And we, she can mention the TV show and she's on the cover of 2K and whatever, but we have nothing for her right now to promote. I feel like she needs to have something at WrestleMania, but I don't know what the fuck they could do with her really at this point, other than to tag her up with Jade and put her in the tag title match or to have her go up against Jade. Nothing else seems to be a worthwhile use for her. And, she did mention that she's got a streak going on, so now I'm kind of like, well, they're going to keep that going. Is she going to be the new like Undertaker in Undertaker some ways? Kind of like, I, I wasn't nearly as bothered by this as you were, because I thought uh, Bianca's great for this. She had the prepared line about, you know, I headlined the first, first two black women, me and Sasha Banks headlined WrestleMania, and then I won the title and I beat Asuka. And then they sent her out there to do press after the event where she can promote her reality show. She can promote UK. I just felt like this year of all years, Bianca doesn't have a championship. And it really felt like this was the year, given the position she's in, where she could have the championship. Especially when you consider that Bailey and EO weren't even there. And I know, yeah. I know that some people are going to be like, yeah, but they're going to be fe- featured heavily on SmackDown tonight. And you can't put everybody on there and no, blah, blah, I, blah. But it's like, yeah. nah, that kind of makes them look like they are no. really less than. The two you people know? you're talking to wouldn't have that response. No, no but well, I know that well, that's been a response that's been online. I'm saying. I mean, I mean, prior to this press conference taking place, that was your one official match announced for WrestleMania. Right. And it, it didn't feels make, weird that they, they weren't there. And they weren't there at all. And I'm not saying like, it needs to be the most prominently featured thing, but looks like that's like a one of your quote unquote main events, even though it's not going to main event either night. But that's neither here nor there. But essentially, yeah, this is your Royal Rumble winner. He's going to be fighting for one of your top world titles. Doesn't even get a feature, or the world champion herself doesn't get a chance to feature on this at all. It's um, yeah, I think that's pretty. I, I, I just nece- wouldn't necessarily have done that thing, especially because you're featuring someone who has no match 
booked for WrestleMania, as you mentioned, with Bianca Belair. And then the other one is you basically just spoiled who's going to win the Elimination Chamber <laughs> in the other one. So. As if it wasn't so obvious to begin with, from just the fact that they've been teasing those two fighting for months, and that there is no bigger star on Raw, and that Becky is the only person that's confirmed for it so far, they were just like, yeah, there's no fucking way it's anybody else, so... Well, Liv Morgan fans, I'm sorry. She's not fucking winning that. <laughs> you know? Well, I'm not sold on that yet. I mean, I'm, I'm way so I'm way more sold on it after last night. But Bianca did also say that she was going to shoot for Rhea because she's in the chamber. And she still wants to be champion. That, that kind of gets swept under the rug with all the other shit that got announced. But she did announce that at least that she was coming for Rhea. I think that that's mostly just because EO is already locked. So it's like, hey, I can try to figure out my way. But well, yeah, but I, I mean, mean they, at least they, on they SmackDown try. tonight, they could do something where I mean, we've said a couple different times already before, but they haven't said, you know, confirmation one way or another that like maybe they do want to have something happen where like Bianca gets thrown in there and it's Bianca and um, Rhea and. Becky or something because that's a you know Michin and Belair going in the qualifying match tonight. We know it's a crossover elimination chamber now. Um, speaking of since, since we're not going to touch on SmackDown, otherwise, I I think that Logan Paul is going to defend his title in the chamber. I still think it's going to be number one contender for the men because Nick Aldis is going to announce his next challenger, and I could see him being like. You don't just have one challenger, you have five. Because you're going in the elimination chamber. I can see that being a path. But back to the uh Could back be. to the press conference thing. You know, with Becky, who wasn't announced, you had her just show up and do something else. I thought that Jade might have done that for Bianca. They didn't go that route, and I understand it, but it would have been nice to see what is Bianca doing here. Because you know, it clearly had an effect on you, at least. Yeah, that was one of those, like, kind of downsides for that thing for me. Um, the main thing, of course, for the press conference was the whole Roman and Cody and Seth and The Rock thing. But any other moments from that you guys want to touch upon before we get into that? Yeah, Becky Lynch told Rhea Ripley that she was going to make her a bottom. I thought that was great. Yeah. And it made me kind of mad that they haven't had Becky looking as strong because I'm like, she doesn't feel as invincible going into this match. You could have really made it like too, you know, irresistible force and move object kind of thing. But it's going to be a fun one. And I didn't realize until they said it last night that they haven't wrestled ever yet. Yeah, I can now. Yeah, they haven't, huh? Yeah, once you say that, you're like, oh, good job keeping them separate then. Hmm. So, obviously, the biggest, biggest thing of this whole thing was that whole we want Cody situation. And prior to this, The Rock had been on the Pat McAfee show and had coined the term that he's going to say ad nauseum for the next two fucking months, which is. Cody crybabies. Now, everybody's getting so enraptured in this that it's working. Like, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, the fucking Cody crybaby thing it proves that he's really upset about that. And you could tell that he was really mad and all this. And it's like, you know what? That could be true to a certain extent. If you're The Rock and if you think that you're going to go into this and it's going to be met with like, oh my God, The Rock is back, thank God. And instead, people are making images. I don't know if you guys had seen this, but there's one, you know that um that meme of like the Grim Reaper knocking on different doors? Mm-hmm. And it's like... I saved that one to my phone. <laughs> it's like like the fourth door is like whatever the joke is that you're making it, but like the three other one things are things that they've already killed. Somebody has one of The Rock, and it's like uh, the XFL and DC and... Uh, Fast and the Furious, and then it's like knocking on, you know, WrestleMania or WWE or whatever. There's a lot of backlash for that. Of course, there's a lot of people that are like, fuck the Cody Rhodes story. I want to see The Rock versus Roman Reigns. And we've been dealing with that ever since the 
past week from what we had going on where like i didn't watch monday night raw i was just like you know i don't fucking care like i, I don't want to be talking about this for the next couple months and you've heard this podcast a million times before if it's something that i don't like i'm still gonna watch if it's something that i really don't like my motivation is kind of crapped out on to really get like super invested and some things have a bigger effect than some other things because you know hey man i really wish that diy wins those tag titles and they didn't boo okay moving on and then the next like two minutes and then other things are like fuck me brock lesnar's gonna have the title for like nine months and he's not gonna do jack shit you know what i mean like i really don't want to write those articles a million times Glad you went with that one because yes, you did establish a Brock Lesnar rule. Exactly. <laughs> and like I really wasn't looking forward to spending the next two and a half months dealing with talking about how I'm not interested in WrestleMania. So I didn't watch Raw. I by proxy didn't watch Dynamite because I was just like, I don't fucking want to watch wrestling at all. I only watched NXT because I had to do the coverage for it because nobody else was covering it for me. So I was like, all right, well, I'm not gonna not do that on the website. But uh even then, I was, like, checked out as much as I could when it came to NXT. And NXT, like, they've got nothing to do with this whatsoever. And, you know, it's not their fault that this is happening. It's not anybody else's fault either, for that matter. But uh, they go into this with this hype of the We Want Cody stuff. And there is this general sense from the press conference of anti-rock, for the most part. Anytime that he's shown, he's getting booed. And there's lots of we want Cody chance and everything. Very pro CM Punk, of course. And I'm still not entirely convinced that he's actually I'm 100% very, I'm out there. Very much convinced. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm still like in that camp of yeah, it's probably the case. But I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't know. But the long and short of this, for anybody who didn't see it and it's living under a rock, not Dwayne. You know what I mean? Uh. Seth Rollins comes out. Roman Reigns comes out. They have a good back and forth. There was a nice little tit for tat where Rollins had said, uh, hey, look, he showed up for work. And then Roman's like, and he showed up for work in his wife's shoes. And like, you know, it's a kind of banter that I like to see. And Roman proceeds to completely eviscerate rollins again and be like you're fucking nothing i don't care nobody gives a shit about the the b championship and all this stuff and i'm like god damn they're really crapping on this belt they're really doing like if they don't have a plan to make it seem like it's you know gonna get a bump up god damn are they just repeating everything that everybody's been saying for these past couple of months and not making it look better right i mean so the way that this ended gives you hope that they're definitely going to include Rollins in all of this. But as it stands, if they don't, they have they have done a great disservice. So not only Rollins, but like McIntyre, who's been working his ass off trying to make that title mean something. Uh, but these, these promos on social media, you're doing a disservice to anybody on Raw who could have become a thing if, you know, you kept that belt in prominence. It's it's not fair what, what they have done to him, but kind of, I don't know where they're going in a good way. Because by the end of this, Roman has said, well, I choose to fight The Rock. And The Rock comes out and effectively plays tweener heating uh heading towards heel in some ways where it's sort of like all right yeah this is going to be the biggest event do you think that roman's going to win do you think that i'm going to win do you think it's going to be the biggest event of whatever i think that they had a little bit of a missed opportunity here because he says uh he shows the screen of the bloodline and it's the anawaii family tree which i'm sure is missing like 200 extra people in there <laughs> but obviously they're putting I, I the people that are ones on there they had people in there that I wouldn't think that they would necessarily had on there, like a Jacob they, Fatu they, and all. And they added the Snooker connection somehow. So that's a, that's canon. Yeah, the yeah. Nia Jax in there. They put Naomi in there. It's you know married to Jimmy Uso. Like they did their due diligence for that, and they just naturally didn't mention the people that aren't 
in the slightest bit a part of wrestling because they're not going to be like and then this person's got eight kids and one of them works at walmart and like whatever you know they're not going to bother with that but they put that out there and they made this whole big thing about like that this is the bloodline this is this story and all this is the top royal family I really thought it was ridiculous that they didn't play the music. <laughs> it's such a softball. Like, it's the one royal family. And instead of wrestling has more than one royal family, it's Cody going, that's bullshit. <laughs> oh, this is bullshit. So before we get onto the Cody of it all, I, I do want to talk about this part because it's good. This, all of it was good to me, at least. And you have Roman say, doesn't matter. You know, Seth Rollins is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what Cody wants. He had his chance to make a decision. Now I'm making the decision. I want to fight The Rock. And Rock comes out. And this is the one part where I can go, maybe it bothered him a little bit. Because you can tell that the original plan was just, here's the family tree. Here's why this matters. Here's why I'm going to beat your monkey ass at WrestleMania. Calls him a bitch because that's one of his only lines. (laughs) They had the graphic up of Roman and Rock and the family tree in between. And you're going, oh, man, they had this whole thing. Like, this was the story. And kudos to them for pivoting and going, you know, do you think that uh, this is the biggest match ever? And if you don't, you don't matter. That's where Rock goes a little more heel. But I do think it bothered him that when he said, do you think Roman's going to beat me? Everybody literally goes, yeah, they're like, it's, that's exactly what's going to happen. I, th- I don't think he was expecting that much of a reaction to be like, not only do we not want you over Cody, but like, we just think you're going to lose. The yeah. Like, and if you win, we're going to be mad about it. Cause then it's going to be like, you didn't need to come in and beat Roman. Roman should have beaten you. And, and then they did this thing where, which is a tone deaf thing. Cause you would think anybody with, two fucking eyes and uh, two ears would be able to see and hear this or even one ear and one eye. And then they did this thing where once Roman and rock like did the, like the handshake and the hug, I went up. Okay. Cody's absolutely positively not going to look at this and choose Seth Rollins. So pick up where you left off there. Tony. So there's good and bad things to this. Uh, I'm not letting them off the hook for the bad things. No, same as, you know, if I really, really like something, I'm still going to talk about the bad things. And, you know, if I really hate something, I'm going to talk about the good. But Cody comes out. He's like, this is bullshit. You don't get the right to choose your WrestleMania main event. I get the right to choose that because I won the fucking Royal Rumble and I choose you, Roman. And immediately I'm like, oh, OK, because <laughs> the fact that he had Seth behind him kept making me go. I don't want fucking Cody to be like, and I choose you Rollins and I'm turning heel or any kind of dumbass twist that they would have done in the past. Just want him to beat Roman for the belt at this year's WrestleMania since they didn't do it at last year's. And I still think it's going to be a mistake that they didn't do it last year and all, but maybe in their mind, they're just like, well, it's a bigger deal if we do it at WrestleMania 40 because it's WrestleMania 40. Okay. But I'm really fucking confused about a lot of things here because they basically set up Seth didn't do fuck all. Mm-hmm. He's just off on the corner by himself. Everybody's like crapping on him. And then he's like, Hey, I'm here. God damn it. And the two of them are basically fighting rock and Roman who are basically a team. And yeah, you know, there's a little thing afterward after the slap rock slaps Cody and that gets into a, a brawl and all, but rock and Roman leave together. And, Oh, Rock, Rock and Roman are aligned. It's, Rock it's, tells uh, Triple H, like, if you don't sort it out, then we will, because, like, he insulted the family. So when you insult Roman's family, you insult mine. It's the same family and all. They're full blown. Rock and Roman are a duo. And it's either going to be. I mean, right now it's advertised as just Roman and Cody. But the Rock's got to do something here. They can't just have this whole thing and then go, well, we decided not to have the Rock whatsoever, and this makes no sense, whatever. But a lot of things make no sense. They just completely didn't address the idea that Cody Rhodes fucking came out on SmackDown and said, I don't want the fucking match that I want. I'd rather the Rock take my spot and then leave sad. None of that makes any sense, and I do not give a shit. 
for the people that are sitting there going, oh, you just needed to wait for this to play out and it was all going to make sense. No, it doesn't. It is very clear that they did not have the right fucking idea there. They either wanted this to be Cody Roman as a backup if they couldn't get the rock. And then they got the rock after the Royal Rumble and then said, fuck it. That's the only thing we can think of is he just gives it up for the rock and we'll figure it out later. Everybody's going to be okay with Cody and Seth. And then they decided that they had to pivot based off of the whole reaction or they're just terrible fucking storytellers because we like to do the analogy here and there of like infinity war about like playing the long game that the rock keeps talking about. Imagine a fucking 10 years worth of Thanos ends with squirrel girl pops up and is like, never mind, I'll just beat him. And then we're going to introduce another villain in infinity war. And it's just, uh, you know, galactus it would be stupid it wouldn't make any sense so you were way more positive on this than i was which is a rarity but up to this point before the slap i'm going oh i fucking hate this because you just had cody retcon everything and they're gonna make these people think we did it our, our complaining work. And I was just like, I, I hate all of this. You had the man go out on TV and say, I do not, I will not be fighting you, Roman, at this year's WrestleMania. Those were words that he said. It wasn't like he said, I haven't decided yet. He said, it's not you, not this year. Right. He specifically said, I'm coming for that title. I'm coming not, for you, but not, not at WrestleMania. WrestleMania. I've taken counsel. Here's a, the fucking rock which whatever that's supposed to mean because what's the council the rock's like maybe you should give it to me and he went okay like it's stupid it, it doesn't make any fucking was going sense. to be in my perspective hey the rock is is an actual chief in samoa and he's gonna beat your ass and steal your tribal chief title and then when you lose that i'm gonna steal the other title But the problem is they didn't count on people just going, no, (laughs) we we don't want that. So they tried to have Cody make up for it by going, yeah, I had a conversation with you, but I've had lots of conversations and I now choose you, Roman. And it was just like, all right, fine. You've gotten yourself out of that hole, but you you just don't look any better. And then I, I, as soon as Rock stood next to Roman and you could see that they were aligned. I was like, all right, let's see where they go. And then once he slapped them and you're going, oh shit, is Seth going to try to fight them too? Oh, are we getting a tag match? And I think it was made even better by like Big E and Michael Cole and them going, yeah, I have no idea what we're getting here, which is, you know, really good. I think that's a, a strong way to go here. I think Rock immediately looking like like his cousin here who's power hungry you know i'm on the board i can do whatever the fuck i want you know this guy is the tribal chief and they sold me on the walkout where he goes yeah okay i get it i get it i understand what you're doing never never again will i let them disrespect us so right now it's cody versus roman Rock has said he will wrestle at WrestleMania. And Seth is sort of just in limbo. Seth is in limbo. I have a few visions of where this could go, but I want to get Callum's opinion on some of this. There's not much more to kind of add to the on what you guys have already said. It's yeah, it's it's terrible storytelling because they've just essentially they said that they're not going to do Co- Cody specifically said in that SmackDown promo that he's not fighting Roman at WrestleMania. And then a week later, they realized, oh, fuck, we probably should make, let Cody face Roman at WrestleMania. <laughs> and, they, and, and they didn't do anything to really explain the change in his mood. He just said, I won the Royal Rumble, so I get to choose who I face at WrestleMania and I'm fighting Roman Reigns. But OK, you decided to just change your mind over the course of a week, which I guess he's entitled to do. But, you know doesn't really make it's not really satisfying from a story perspective um i thought the segment was very well done i think that they i I almost would have bought into it more if it was something on the lines of 
Rock comes out to confront Roman and then they start, you know, having fun with each other. And then Cody comes out and says, oh, fuck this bullshit. Like, I, I, I specifically like, either gave you the match or gave you the opportunity because you said that you wanted to take down Roman. But it said, like, no, they're essentially just, hey, my family likes the idea of we, we need to do this for our family. We're, we're, we're actually cool with each other, but, like, we feel like this is important because we're the the two big names of our family and it needs to be, it needs to match. It's a match that needs to happen rather than uh, I'm here to take the head of the table stuff, or I'm sick of you being world champion and I'm going to take it from you. It's more like, Hey dude, do you want to wrestle? Yeah, yeah let's, re- let's wrestle. That's kind of, that's kind of the <laughs> attitude the rock was taking going into it. And so Cody gets pissed off at that and he's instead decides, okay, I'm, if you're going to take that attitude, then I'll challenge Roman instead. And then, he has a go at Roman's family, and so the Rock gets involved. And says you're having a go at his family, it means you're having a go at my family. He slaps me in the face. Um, I think that um, there are some things that I'm not super keen on about it. Main thing being the slap, and then the fact that Cody and or and or Seth didn't get any shots in on them yep. makes them look like like a little bit lesser than the Rock and Roman, which is essentially what there's been the WWE creative ever since uh, Roman got to the top of the, t- the tree anyway. I'm okay then, with that for now. If they have them, they, like in particular, if they have Cody come out on top at Mania, then I think putting them in the underdog position now isn't necessarily bad. Yeah. The other thing that I'm not super keen on about this is the fact that I think that on, on the surface, is it, this is Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes. I think at a deeper level, this storyline is actually The Rock versus Triple H. That's something I wanted to get into. I think we have a very good chance here that... Well, they could go in a number of directions and uh, very speed round, WWE speed. Uh, People are talking about, is there going to be a tag team match? Are they going to do anything at Elimination Chamber? Which I don't think that's going to be the case. Are they going to do The Rock against Seth Rollins on night one and then Cody and Roman on night two? Are they going to do a triple threat? Are they going to do There's all sorts of different things. But the fact that they did this whole thing with Triple H and The Rock and the backstage thing makes me kind of think we might end up getting just Roman versus Cody. And The Rock might be in Roman's corner and Triple H might be in Cody's. And it might be like a WrestleMania 2000 type thing to an extent where it's like, we're backing the guy we want to be the champion. And that could be first thing first again about this. Cody needs to fucking win that title. Like if they end up having anything that happens where it's like the rock screws over Cody and Roman retains and that way we can wait another year and it could be rock and Roman next year. So I'm going to be incredibly pissed, but I think that we might get something between triple H and the rock offsetting each other so i see where you're going but i didn't get that i personally didn't get that idea now triple h is the only person in this mess who's currently advertised to be on tonight's episode of smackdown to address everything that's happened could we see some fallout there possible but i didn't get the feeling like okay we're gonna build an underlying story for months and months to come of the rocks guys versus hunters guys oh i totally got that feeling yeah i 100 like, percent got that even if it's not necessarily the people in the corner of mania i feel like there's supposed to be a power struggle i think that this is this is gonna be this is a year plus long story that's now started i think that this is this is now pub this is now gone from just being about cody finishing the story to a power struggle behind the scenes mm-hmm. i'm all right with that I'm not. It's pure Vince Russo bullshit. This is WCW 2000 coming to life again. I I hear you. I do. But when I look at the particular, if they choose to go this route, given the players involved, I think it's a fun evolution of Rock versus Cody. I think if they want to do the thing that would just make people go fucking crazy, and I don't think this is happening for anybody who's wondering, imagine this scenario. They do whatever they do with Seth Rollins on night one, which I'm still kind of leaning towards. I'll spoil this. I think that Seth Rollins fights the winner of the Elimination Chamber. It's Drew McIntyre. Drew McIntyre comes up short or wins the belt 
and immediately gets cashed in on by Damian Priest in night one. I don't think Rollins is going to be in a tag match on night one, you know, the rock and Roman against Seth and Cody and the title's not on the line. I don't think that's happening, but imagine they do whatever they do with that. And then on night two, they have the rock backing up Roman Reigns, triple H backing up Cody Rhodes and a special guest referee is Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> imagine they do that shit and it ends up being like these three legends and all. And then it's like, you, know, you say that, but like they would just, that would be endeavor being like, can we just fucking throw it all out there? Can we have the special ring announcer instead of, uh, the special ring bell the person instead of, of the, yeah, yeah, I was, was going to say, instead of them ringing a bell, uh, the special, guest bell timer is the undertaker and it's a gong <laughs> yeah. but, but i'm but i'm just thinking well it, it, it's better it's better than my other scenario which is that you do the whole rock in roman's corner and triple h in cody's corner and then triple h screws cody into roman winning i'll be so pissed about that too and then it's like then there's like a, a new power struggle with the, the power at the top and like that's a new authority being established under the Anawai family being the authority, because essentially, I mean, now if you look at it, look at it, the Anawai family is now like the most powerful wrestling family because mm-hmm. their man's essentially don't exist in WWE anymore. Depending on how heavy they lean in Rock now, because they were definitely not shy about being like, "Yeah, well, he's on the board; he can do whatever he wants." And yeah, that's, then, the po- that's the point. But then that even changes NXT, doesn't it? Like. They can really make it look like Ava okay, SGM. The fix was in from the minute he got on the board. <laughs> Talk about and- the long uh, game when it comes to Vince having a working partnership with uh, the Anawai family in the territory days and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and well, it's well, like, yeah, we just, took over. Just as you mentioned, Ava, fuck all the people that are sending her death threats over everything. So. Yeah, you know, we didn't talk yeah, about that yet. Yeah, fuck that. That's, yeah. that's fucking stupid. Uh, we're. You know, we're varying levels of hashtag we want Cody and whatever on this. And it's like, it would never dawn on us to do that. She's not fucking in control of that. And even if she was, it's not something to send a death threat over you, jackasses. Yeah, but, Shave your head you know, and go to sleep, as Christian Harloff would say. You know, wrestling fans have to get weird about everything. Mm-hmm. Well, you know how obsessive everybody is. And I was having this discussion with Caroline the other day about how, like, wrestling is the you take the obsessive soap opera crowd, the people that would be all invested in like, Oh no, it was his evil twin and whatever. And you mix in the obsessive sports crowd that are all like, I, I bleed red because my team is the Cardinals or whatever the fuck. And like, uh, you mix them all together in with like the comic book nerds that all go to the movies like me. And it's like, they show a reference to something and you're like, that's issue number, whatever. And fucking, you know, so we're all the worst. <laughs> the worst fucking but, people out there. I mean, I would say that like this whole situation, like as seemingly WWE doesn't really care about being super logical with the storytelling aspect of this. So if we take that out of consideration, take the whole this doesn't make any logical sense out of the out of the situation just briefly. I say I don't think they should get a pat on the back for this or anything along those lines because as I say nothing that they've done over the past week or so has made much sense. No. But I would say that now that they've reached this conclusion, it's probably it's probably all worked out great for them. Mm-hmm. Because essentially, by doing this whole by essentially inciting the fans, whether this was the intention or not, inciting the fans into this we want Cody movement and everything like that. They made Cody more over than he was prior, to, even after winning the Rumble. He's more over now than he was like the week beforehand. Uh, they've got The Rock to kind of turn heel and is more interesting as a heel now than he would have been just as like, you know, just cracking wise about how... Uh, Roman Roman's a bitch and, and singing yeah, a song and, and, pass and stuff like that or whatever and his ponytail was ridiculous or whatever and just like just using that as the crux of it instead um so yeah realistically they've made this match more interesting than it would have been beforehand which we all kind of looked at to feel like okay we all know that what they should have done is have Cody win the title at last year's Wrestlemania and before uh, let's, let's just say by argument's sake, they just decide to go oh, straight into just Cody fighting Roman. Cody just comes out on that episode of SmackDown and says, I'm fighting you at WrestleMania. 
then essentially that match WrestleMania is all about just, you know, finishing off what should have happened a year earlier. That's the only reason fans would be interested in it is because we can finally see Cody win when he should have won last year. Mm -hmm. Now, with all the stuff they have done, they've added layers and added more intrigue to it by the introduction of The Rock and what Triple H's involvement and potentially if Seth's involved in this as well. It's now a more muddled but more intriguing prospect than what it previously would have been they they briefly took away what we all wanted or what most people wanted as the main event of wrestlemania and then they've given it straight back to us and so we're more invested in it than we would have otherwise been so by that standard they did everything right it's that's kind the only, of the, that's uh, the only goal they did it all right <laughs> yeah if if you don't care how you get to the destination, you only care how the destination plays out. We, of course, still don't know what happens when it comes to Mania, but there's going to be apologists that are going to say, like, the road to get there doesn't matter. It's just the ends that justify the means. And a lot of people are going to look at that and say, I don't care whatsoever. They can just edit that out. Like the whole Cody with The Rock on SmackDown, they can they edit can that out of uh, other the promos leading up to mania and then for anybody who didn't watch that episode it makes a lot more sense to them and all but um and uh stay tuned for this uh josh is going to write up something on smart Home moment about this probably this weekend so um uh, i'm not going to dive too deep into it. i'm going to kind of let him talk about it on there but i think one of the biggest fundamental problems with this is that there are so many other better ways that they could have told the story that does make sense and gets you exactly what you're hoping for if the goal is to get to the spot that they're in right now which is heel rock heel roman babyface cody i think the simplest easiest best way of doing it is you just you have cody go out on raw rollins does the whole thing about Hey, before you make a decision, keep in mind, this is the workhorse title, all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. Cody says, you give me a lot to think about. I got to go to SmackDown this week and I'm going to make a decision after that. Cool. We keep that exactly the way that it is. We don't need to have Roman crap all over the world heavyweight championship. I know some people are like, well, if he talked crap about Roman, he should talk back to no, that's already, it's like kicking somebody when they're already down. The world heavyweight title needs a boost. It doesn't need more people to justify the anti WHC sentiment. Have Cody come out, have him be like, Seth has given me a lot to think about and whatever, but I still want that championship and it's still on my mind and whatever. And then The Rock interrupts. I said this a week ago. And The Rock just forces himself into there and says as a member of the TKO board or whatever, I'm not letting you make that decision. We need to talk about this some more and has a stare down with Roman and whatever. And it makes everybody go, Oh fuck. He's taking it away from him. And then you can have a segment on raw where the rock can be like, I really think that you should go for Seth. Cause I think that it makes more sense for me to fight Roman and exert his control like that to where everybody goes, this guy's a fucking stooge and he is abusing his power. And we want Cody to say, fuck you rock. Because I think one of the biggest problems here, not only the whole, I'm giving up the title shot. Here you go. Never mind. Side note. The Rock, I don't think, has once said that he would be fighting for the championship. And if they thought that they could just have this as a non-title match at fucking WrestleMania, that's stupid. He said it last night. He did last night? Specifically say, say the championship? Roman Reigns, The Rock, the Undisputed Universe of Champions. Oh, okay. Is the biggest um, match ever. Because it seems like he had been focusing more on the whole head of the table thing. Um, which, of course, they could still do in the future. But uh, I think that one of the problems here is... We did get a lot of people that are saying hashtag we want Rocky and saying the Cody crybabies thing and all. And I don't think it's smart to make the decision to have Cody look weaker in the terms of the babyface position. There are definitely people that are going to want the rock to win this match. And that's going to take away from the Cody win if he does win, which he should fucking win. And then if the rock wins, the rock fans are going to be happy, but the Cody fans are going to be like, fuck you. Why did you do this again? 
you shouldn't have even bothered to have him in there if he's just going to lose again. And if Roman wins, people that are the Rock fans are going to be mad and people that are the Cody fans are going to be mad. And not in a way that I think it's going to be like, grr, but I can't wait until WrestleMania 41. I think that's going to be like, you motherfuckers have to stop teasing me. I'm done. Because a lot of people that I know that haven't been interested in wrestling over the past year from the Cody thing are still not really all that interested in it because they were burned from last year and you burn more of them again. It's not a good idea, but even if it ends with the big hurrah of Cody winning, the rock fans are going to be mad. So now you just diminished the positive ending because you had to have the rock in there to put him as a baby face at first. I think that's a mistake. So I think it's, Less likely as we go through this. I think The Rock will do his best to be as antagonizing as possible so that Cody win means more because I got the vibe, with the exception of Seth Rollins, who's still dangling out there. I got the vibe that, oh, they're just going to do the Daniel Bryan thing, except it's going to be instead of Bryan versus Triple H. It'll be Brian versus uh, Rock versus Cody night one. And then Rock for, and then Cody versus Roman. And Cody beats them both. Like in the same way that, you know, Brian beat every member of Evolution. And that's still a possibility. There's still a chance that maybe it does become a triple threat and the Rock's like, hey, by the way, I'm forcing myself in here. Maybe there is a tag match scheduled to incorporate Rollins. Maybe they want to do night one is Cody and Roman or night one is um, Cody and rock. And then that leads into the Roman thing. I don't know, man. The one thing, whether it is, if we just assume, okay, it ends in the Cody thing or whatever. I still don't know what the hell they're doing with Rollins. Rollins is absolutely He's okay because, like I said, which is why I'm mad that they're shitting on the belt. There is still a great story with McIntyre underneath this. There is still a great story that they started out on Monday that we didn't talk about because we didn't talk about Raw. But Sami Zayn set the stage for, like, I'm no longer an underdog. I will be world champion. There's a lot of heat between... Zayn and McIntyre. It's just, and this is the problem that happens every time we get a part-timer in the main event picture, it's just that no one's talking about it because it's so obviously less than. That's the main issue. That's the reason why I'd, I wouldn't mind the idea of, well, why don't we do Roman Seth night one, Rock Cody night one, and then winner's face, you know, or something incorporating Seth into this so that he gets a little bit of what he's, you know, owed as well. Because if he just goes off and does, say, the three-way that I keep pitching with Zane and McIntyre, by the way. By the way, I see Zane winning and then getting cashed in on. I mean, that Zane could happen. Overcome. There's also um, a hashtag of we want Drew going on on Twitter right now. <laughs> yeah, because Drew is just, he's absolutely killing it. Yeah. He's, he's all like, so dialed in right now that, like, you wouldn't even realize... He was the third string heel on Raw, you know, and doing great work. But there there are a lot of paths. And like Callum said, don't want to excuse the bullshit of it all. I am still very much mad that they had Cody just retcon things. And they're like, okay, that's fine because we give you what you want. But I much prefer this feeling of, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. And now I'm actually intrigued. Versus, okay, cool, they corrected course and we know where we're going. Or worse, oh my god, I can't believe they've somehow managed to make Cody and the world title look worse than before. <laughs> it could have been a lot worse. It could have been definitely better. And we still don't know if by the end of this we're going to be, like, pissed. <laughs> we could end up having another, the end of uh, WrestleMania you know, we're on the post show and we're all just like 
disillusioned again where we could be like ah oh, thank god this is over and then you know move on I'm to the next I chapter of the story authority run from rock but if you tell me rock's gonna be in the in the immediate future like let's say the next six months a regular character i wouldn't mind that like i'd be willing to see where anything goes if you tell me that we've got some interesting players that was the problem Roman beat Cody was it was just like so what is he just gonna fuck off now and do nothing and that's what he did right but if you tell an interesting story coming out of things I'm cool with any of that now I'll say this and this will be what I leave it on there is the Triple H thing tonight there is the chance that he just says well per the board it will be The Rock versus Cody Rhodes on the first night of Wrestlemania with the winner taking on Roman Reigns on the second night, and you have the opportunity to create for the first time ever, Cody Rhodes becomes the first wrestler to headline both nights. And it could be the type of thing where it's like, well, The Rock versus Cody Rhodes on night one. If The Rock wins, he takes over Cody's match, so it puts it in jeopardy. Even if Cody wins, but which, and of course, if that happens, people are going to be fucking pissed. But um, the last thing I think to mention here, because we are over two hours on this podcast again already. <laughs> uh, right now, what would you, ignoring what you think is going to happen, what would you do for these belts and the, the Seth thing and the main event of Mania and all that, what would you guys book? I think I would book... I would book Roman and Seth in the main event of the first night of this. I would book Cody and Rock. And you would book that as like a title for title unification thing? Yes. I would book Cody and Rock open the first night of wrestling. And then I have Cody beat Rowan in the second night of this. Leading to what in the future? Cody's got a unified title and then what? And the brands, as you've been saying, with the move to Netflix, who knows if the brands are even going to be split? It could be a long game as to merge to one WWE so that cable fans and streaming fans can see their favorites. Could be. I don't know, but I'm I'm genuinely intrigued by the ride. What would you book, Alan? Um, with my kind of what's best for business head on, I probably would say I'd book uh, Rock versus Seth for the World Championship at um night one of WrestleMania, and I'd have the Rock win the World Title, and then I'd have Roman lose the title to Cody on the second night of WrestleMania. And then that could set the seeds for The Rock being the definitive head of the table. And then you set in motion what will eventually be The Rock versus Roman Reigns at uh, WrestleMania 41. Not necessarily for any championship on the line, but just basically sow the seeds of distrust because... And, uh, oh, oh, well, based on what I saw on this one, it, it, it definitely looked like after the... Um, in the segment where like Rock is cussing out Triple H backstage... Rome Reigns felt a lot like Solo Sokoa. Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 And that's like, yeah. So so I think that that could be the idea of him little brothering him and have him having a world championship would be a way of doing that. If it's like just what I think is best for the future or trying to do things for by try do things right by the full timers, I'd probably do um Cody and Cody and Seth versus Roman and Rock in a tag match on night one. I'd have well, it depends what you want to do with this. If you want Rock to eventually just be a baby face straight up again, you'd have the heels lose, Roman attacks Rock afterwards, and then Rock helps Cody beat Roman on night two. If you still want to have the heel Rock thing, then I'd have the Roman pin Cody in that match and then have Cody beat Roman on the second night just as a means of like just putting doubt in people's minds that, oh my God, he's just going to beat him again constantly. Um... I mean, I mean, fundamentally, like, uh, would I'm I'm taking myself in the mindset of someone who would actually who actually cares about where WWE goes beyond this point. 
Um, my biggest concern is that all of this, all of the stuff involving Roman, Seth, Cody, whoever, is all going to be supplanted by a, a story between The Rock and Triple H in 2024, which we know can't end in a match. Right, Triple H isn't Triple H. wrestling. Yeah, but I just think that they're just in, in the same way you mentioned the like WrestleMania 2000 earlier. I think that this there's a real possibility that all the backstage stuff is going to or the uh, boardroom power struggle stuff is going to supplant the actual wrestlers on tv which you know can be good as a short-term rating thing but it's not good for long-term building credibility of the actual wrestlers so but you know if the rock is here on a more permanent basis because he's part of the board then maybe that's not as much of an issue but i think that I think that we could be entering into that world of like the quote unquote non wrestlers or the the board members or the general managers or however you want to phrase it are gonna be more important than the actual wrestlers again. So that's my that's my one concern, but that's how I would book it if I could. And you know, I did think about the possibility that Seth might have fallen ass backwards into a match with the rock which would be amazing and really cool for him yeah. i think i think we potentially well i i take this perspective i don't know if you both would agree maybe rob doesn't but i think the whole in all of this obviously this whole confusing situation there has been like a lot of a lot of kind of good uh, enthusiasm and excitement for this match has been built up because of this thing. I think the one overarching negative, one well, one major overarching negative, of this whole thing, is that Seth feels lesser than he's ever felt yeah. in this title run. Yeah, like he he feels like he's nothing. He feels like he's desperate mm-hmm. to be take to be acknowledged and taken seriously, and no one takes him seriously. And 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 by proxy, it means anyone that will ever challenged for that title feels lesser than because they could do a situation because we saw it 10 years ago where like for example just ziggler when ziggler won the world title by that point in wwe lore that world title didn't mean anything but ziggler is still touted as a two-time world champion so it'd be funny if like rob scenario like the unification thing country because in which case that'd be like the worst run of the title in history, maybe. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it absolutely would. But at what point? One guy show... holds it. One guy holds it all the way through from when he won it to WrestleMania and did absolutely really nothing with the title. Everyone thought he was worthless anyway, and then they just got rid of it. But it would, yeah, be, as... it would be terrible. But like you, like you say, you know, if they just do, hey, it's Drew versus Seth again. Is anybody really going to feel like that? It's not hey, just the Intercontinental Title. Like, for example, and I know, you know, this is what led to Roman having everything which sucked. But prior to Roman getting COVID in 2022, wasn't the plan like, oh, it's going to be Seth Rollins and Big E for the WWE title? And we're all like, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. And in real news, you know, like. But as as I say, like, yeah, that doesn't feel good. But that's that's a bit a mess of WWE's own making. Yeah, absolutely. They should they should have they should have positioned that title better and they've just spent the last well better part of the last two weeks making that title feel irrelevant. So so yeah, yeah, it will it will feel lesser than the other title match, but that's their fault. They should have done a better job. But I do give them credit for at least taking you on a path where it's like, okay, I'm willing to see where it goes. So you know, I, go ahead. I, I... I have a million different if this then that type of things in my head that I wish that I could just like draw on the screen right now and have everybody see. Um, but I think you need to work backwards. And I think, of course, depending on what their plans are for the future, that might change my perspective of this. But assuming a few things, this is where I would kind of go. Number one, I want Cody to win this belt. That belt that Roman Reigns is holding at WrestleMania in the main event of night two. That is set in stone in my mind. If you don't, you are crapping on the biggest baby face that you have had since John Cena. It is the stupidest idea if anything other than that happens. You cannot wait anymore. 
You can't drag it out for another year. You can't have him lose and then try to tell the story that he wins at at SummerSlam. None of that. He needs to finish WrestleMania 40 at the end of it, celebrating with the title. But you need to tell some other stories, too. In my mind, the tribal chief head of the table story does not need to have the championship finish the story at the finale of that thing. I think the head of the table story, it can go past the championship. And I think that people are going to want the rock versus Roman Reigns in a singles match. And I think if you do a triple threat, you're still going to want to do that. I think the rock wants to be heel. I think the rock should be heel. I think this is a way to do it and all. I think that the end game of this should be Cody is the champion at some point in the future. Roman Reigns, as a babyface, beats The Rock in a non-title match. Whether you do it at WrestleMania or not, you know, it remains to be seen. Solo Sokoa needs to get a push. Randy Orton needs to be set up for a feud with uh, Cody Rhodes. Seth needs to have something going on with the championship. Damian Priest has the money in the bank. Drew McIntyre is great. Sami Zayn is great. I am assuming that they don't have anything for Elimination Chamber. Like, they're not going to be able to just get The Rock to do whatever. But maybe they can convince these other guys to do something. Maybe they can do a six-man tag. Maybe it can be, like, Roman and Solo and Jimmy with The Rock in their corner. If The Rock doesn't want to wrestle and potentially risk Mania against... Randy Orton, Cody Rhodes, and uh, Seth Rollins, or something. The problem is, and the, this is because this month has been hell. Um, we're forgetting that Rollins is injured. Well, that's th- that's what like the lesser things for me. Because if you can do it, you do it. If you don't, elimination chamber is fine. I don't think you necessarily do Rock versus Seth Rollins. I think that you can you need to push Rollins out of this as soon as possible, kind of in some ways. But I don't know how they plan on doing that because I think that they're they're shooting themselves in the foot with this. But I would ultimately go. I think that the smartest thing here is you want to do Drew McIntyre versus CM Punk in the future. You want to do Punk against Rollins in the future. I want Sami Zayn to hold that World Heavyweight Championship. I want Drew McIntyre to be in the mix. I want Priest to not be a failure. I want to see something like a triple threat with McIntyre, Sami Zayn, and Rollins. Or maybe Sami Zayn just doesn't get in the mix right now and he gets it later. I want Damian Priest to maybe cash in, do something like that. Bigger story, I think you do incorporate Triple H. I think you do incorporate The Rock. I think you hold off on doing the match at WrestleMania. And you do the the corners thing. And... Something happens where, assuming you do that and not a triple threat, if you do a triple threat at some point, Roman has to spear the rock and you need to have a tension between the two. But Cody needs to beat Roman and the rock needs to be disappointed. And the rock needs to basically tell Solo Sokoa, you have been declared the tribal heir. You need to take over. Roman needs to take some time off because Roman's going to take time off anyway or whatever. You need to be the new guy going forward or whatever. As the real tribal chief, I am declaring you as like the next to pay attention and stuff. Eventually, when Roman comes back, he has a feud with Solo that leads into a match with The Rock over the head of the table title, quote unquote. And that's how you can have everybody get everything in there. You incorporate triple H and the rock with their whole thing. You have Cody win. that's a success, a success. He holds that title until whenever, maybe he loses it to Gunther at bash in Berlin. Maybe he holds it up until mania next year. I don't know, whatever the fuck we can plan that out later. You finish the Cody story. You set up the singles match that the Roman reigns, uh, baby face turn can eventually go with there. It's not the perfect way of doing it, but it's a matter of like you throw a bunch of shit and I'm going to figure out a way to build it into the house. <laughs> kind of, you know what I mean? Like, so tonight SmackDown might end up 
throwing us for another loop. It might end up being Triple H says it's a triple threat match or that The Rock has exerted his control and Cody has to beat The Rock in order to get that match against Roman. And they might end up screwing Cody at Mania again. They might end up having that the quote unquote story is just, no, we want Roman to hold that belt until he beats Hulk Hogan's record. And in the meantime, fuck you for being interested in the American nightmare that has thing. That never and felt less likely. I'm still worried about it. I'm going to be worried about Cody not winning that belt at WrestleMania until until the graphic ends at WrestleMania. And it's not something like Cody wins and then The Rock comes out and says, actually, it's a DQ. Ha ha, fuck you or something like that. But I'm hoping against hope that their game plan, even if it wasn't the game plan a week ago, that their game plan now is we need to end WrestleMania 40 with the babyface winning the belt. Let's do WrestleMania 10, WrestleMania 20, and WrestleMania 30. Let's just do that again. I don't know what we're going to get tonight. Bailey's going to talk. And Way more positive discussion about this than we could have <laughs> guessed on Sunday night. When we my, be- my difference being I went from I don't want to fucking watch any wrestling right now to it's flawed and I'm nervous, but I'm at least... I'm on the ride again. <laughs> <You know? laughs> some rides are great. And then some rides like this one that I went to in a uh, six flags one time, I ended up there near getting a concussion from it. So <laughs> sometimes you don't want to go on a ride again. I don't know. I forget the name of the fucking thing. It was like something with a T probably forgot the ride. Cause it kept banging my fucking head around, but um, <laughs> hopefully that's not in commission anymore. And hopefully we're not uh, wishing that somebody's out of commission for me. <laughs> And uh, then we can come back around to Punk and Rollins down the future and all that stuff. And there's a chance that this all works out. There's a chance that some of it works and some of it doesn't. There's a chance that by the end of tonight, I'm pissed off again, or by the end of the week or the end of the month or the end of the year or whatever it might be. I don't know. But we want to thank you for joining us for this ride for Smack Talk. We want to keep you in the mix of anything else that happens on the hot tags by the next week's hot tags or you know, whatever we decide to do in the meantime, again, no necessarily set in stone plans when it comes to the dark cast right now, or, you know, next week or something we might do the mock draft of elimination chamber stuff. Maybe we'll probably do a double episode with that and the fantasy booking, the dark cast will factor in, in some fashion. Elimination chamber is coming up though. And we got the, uh, call to spot. I'm going to do at some point, go back and check out the most recent main event, the favorite, Royal Rumble moments of all time. If you have not checked that out yet, subscribe, click on all the stuff you see on the link tree on amangotree.com. Make sure you're following not only the smart guy moment stuff, but also the fanboys anonymous stuff. Make sure you're following our personal accounts. I'm at Tony mango, Robin Callum are out there too. Dawson, uh, your plugs. First of all, it was twister. You were thinking of, um, twister was right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm at Dude Police (laughs) everywhere and check out my work on Fightful because that's only going to get more and more crazy as the months go on. We got Mercedes news. We got uh, Sean was one of the few people from wrestling media to actually get interviews yesterday. So we got some Seth interviews, some Becky interviews, a Jade interview coming. Check out Fightful Select, all that good stuff. Again, I'm at Dude Police everywhere and I appreciate your support. And here's Callum. So you can find me on Twitter at Wigmeister14. You can check out the Power Rankings every Saturday on tomarketmoment.com where I rank the WWE Superstars based on their previous week's performance. Uh, Cody might be higher up now than he would have been. Previously. <laughs> uh, but you can also uh, check out the Fantasy League there as well where Cody might be get, picking up some more points as well. I'm, the, I'm not counting the press conference as part of the, the points gathering thing. So. Am I winning but, yet? No, nah, <laughs> and you won't. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, yeah, check out uh, the points, going to sit, how the points are going as we head into Elimination Chamber and then further on into WrestleMania, see which one of me and Tony is going to win this year's uh, Fantasy League competition. And <laughs> that came so close. I won yeah. one thing. Yeah, just check that out at uh, www.fantasyleague.com. <laughs> All right, everybody, any kind of uh, Fantasy League related stuff. That happens in the meantime, if we end up having any trades or anything, we'll obviously tell you. But yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's the hot tags for this episode. Crazy weeks happening in pro wrestling. 
I don't know what we're going to get over the next few days, but we hope that you keep joining us for uh, everything that happens in the meantime. And we will talk to you the next time that we're out there, whether we are on the main event or the dark cast or the hot tags. I don't know, but we're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say too. So for now, that's the only to do us in. Adios, everybody. This has been another smart cow moment and we are being counted out. 